theater of operations, fighter ground support activities are carried on relative to protected shelters which are established to assist survivability. These protected aircraft shelters are contained within the airbase dispersal area and are arranged in a random pattern around a ringed taxiway. Maintenance and servicing activities are controlled and coordinated from the centrally located and protected Squadron Operations Center. Squadron administrative and aircraft records control functions are located in a separate bunker. Within the SOC, the operations and maintenance control room is manned by a small staff who coordinate all activity within the dispersal area. And about. The operations and maintenance control room includes positions for the alert operations officer, the maintenance commander, the technical controller, the bomber, the Bowser controller, and the board clerk. These personnel coordinate their operations in conjunction with the aircraft status board. What's the telling ops, Ricardo? They're taxi. The alert operations officer is a pilot who is responsible for coordinating requirements for individual aircraft sorties and having them posted on the operation side of the aircraft status board. These requirements detail the information which is critical to maintenance, including the pilot walk time, on-state times, start times, and the ordnance and weapons required for the sortie. He receives direction from the Wing Operations Center and details the mission information. Gold's report to the ops desk, report to the ops desk immediately. The alert ops -O also briefs all pilots on the operational state of the dispersal area when they sign out of the operations center. Well, this is your next brag. Okay. Call me as soon as possible with your weapons and what's your walk time going to be so we get it out of the way. Roger. Get right back to you. We should get a call back from them in about two minutes. Cool. Yep. Okay. And uh, there'll be a two ship at least. Going up again? Roger. Okay. Can you make sure... Uh, the maintenance commander is an area officer who is concerned with coordinating all maintenance activities in the dispersal through the operations center's maintenance staff and is the interface between the maintenance organization and the operations staff. He also directs the updating of the dispersal location board which shows the operational status of the shelters and taxiways and the positioning of aircraft and servicing crews. The technical controller coordinates the activities of the PAS crews and mobile units such as the line monitors and snag repair crews. He ensures that the technical part of the operational turnaround is completed with minimum delay. He communicates to the PAS crews through a public address system, by telephone, and with the mobile crews using FM radio. Control, can you uh, radio that one more time please? Over. The bomber coordinates activities of the weapons load officer and the load crews, sharing the same communications links with the tech controller. He is concerned with the weapons and ordnance loads portion of the OTR and details the breakout of ordnance at the explosives area and its convoy to the pass. The Bowser controller coordinates aircraft refueling activity in the dispersal area. In addition, he directs the recording and updating of all status board information and advises the Wing Operations Center on aircraft serviceability and OTR statistics. Over in Cali 14, I'm a little bit of a problem with that 100 hour stuff. Roger. If you want to check. Uh, the board clerk maintains the aircraft status and dispersal location boards.
The process of turning aircraft around to meet incoming taskings necessitates the timely flow of information to the SOC. Okay. Decisions have to be made based on the information available, which must always be completely accurate and current. Critical information involving an operational turnaround for each aircraft is marked on a movable magnetic strip attached to the aircraft status board. beginning of an OTR cycle, the alert operations officer advises that an aircraft returning from a mission has landed. All information concerning the previous OTR is erased from the magnetic strip and is moved to the OTR column on the maintenance side of the status board. Once the aircraft has been winched back into the PAS and chalked, the PAS crew chief advises the tech controller that the technical portion of the turnaround has started. The aircraft is winched in and we're beginning our OTR. The time is noted on the aircraft strip. When the crew arrives to load ordnance, the crew chief calls the bomber who logs their arrival and fills in their crew number on the strip. And low crew, low crew. The load crew chief advises when the ordnance loading begins and calls again when it is completed. The appropriate information is updated on the magnetic strip. The PAS crew chief advises the technical controller when the aircraft has been refueled. Again, when the OTR is 10 minutes from completion, and lastly, when the aircraft is ready for its mission. Birds are light to moderate today, so about 2,000 feet. The alert operations officer then briefs the pilot and details him to walk to his aircraft. And the bird time is, uh, we have no bird When the strip information is completed, it indicates the aircraft is ready. The strip is then moved to the assigned column opposite the appropriate mission on the operations side of the status board. Journey 10 assigned to green. Yep. In the PAS, the pilot signs out the aircraft and proceeds with the sortie. Once the aircraft has started its taxi, the strip is moved to overlap the mission column in the operations side of the status board. Decisions on whether new taskings can be accepted or if an extension is required to the time on target or if an accepted mission needs to be cancelled are based on information displayed on the aircraft status board. Delays in the reporting of completion times or any maintenance problems may result in the postponement or cancellation of a sortie even though the aircraft may in fact be available. If the aircraft lands with a major unserviceability or if, during the OTR, the ground crew uncovers a major repair problem, 
The tech controller is immediately advised and provided with details on the nature of the unserviceability and an estimate of the time required to rectify the problem. This is Charlie 10. The O-ring was pinched on insulation. We're going to need about another 20 minutes. In the sock, the aircraft strip will be moved to the U.S. portion of the board. The problem will be described on the remarks column with the estimated time in commission entered in the ETIC column. Should complications arise delaying the aircraft's return to serviceability, or should the problem be correctable sooner than originally estimated, a new time must immediately be reported. Any mission assigned to an unserviceable aircraft is based upon the time that it is estimated to be back in service. Any delays in the conduct of the OTR not related to aircraft unserviceabilities also need to be reported immediately. The Squadron Operations Center becomes a very busy place during the operational turnaround. Good working procedures, open communications, and timely reporting will go a long way to keeping the squadron at the highest possible level of mission capability. Level medical support is provided by the units of the Core Medical Command, which is structured to provide third line medical support throughout the Corps, second line support to Corps troops, and first line medical support to Corps units lacking self sufficiency. It is also capable of augmenting Division second line medical organizations. The Corps Medical Command includes a coordinating headquarters with its assigned signal squadron, a number of Corps medical groups, and a medical support battalion. It is normally supported at Corps level by medical laundry, bath, and decontamination companies and air ambulance squadrons as may be available. Core medical groups are geographically deployed. Those located in the core forward administrative area are concerned primarily with evacuation, initial surgery, and short-term hospitalization of patients generated from within the division areas. The groups located in the core rear administrative area provide surgery for less urgent cases, backup support to the forward groups, and medical support to the troops in the core rear area. Forward and rear core medical groups normally include the following units. A headquarters and its associated signal troop which provides for the staff communications needs of the group. Three field hospitals forward, four in the rear two forward surgical hospitals, three field medical companies forward, five in the rear, an ambulance transport company, 
and a forward medical replenishment unit with the forward group. The field hospitals function as the major surgical medical facility in the combat zone. They are allocated on the basis of four to the Corps and three to each division. A field hospital can operate independently or as a 500 bed unit within the confines of a core medical center in conjunction with other hospitals. A field hospital can deploy a surgical intensive subunit to meet a specific requirement. The hospitals provide resuscitation, preliminary surgery, and short-term care. They prepare patients for further evacuation, assist stress reaction patients, and provide first-line medical support to local units. Outside assistance is required for handling and transport of certain heavy and bulky items of equipment when the entire entity must deploy. The forward surgical hospitals are allocated on the basis of two per division and one per independent brigade group. The forward surgical hospital provides resuscitation and life-saving emergency surgery, short-term intensive post-operative care, and general emergency medical services. The hospital operates independently of the supported formation and is sited close to main evacuation routes. The field medical companies are allocated on the basis of one per 10,000 troops within the Corps and one for each division. They may be employed as a Corps or Division Medical Station, as a patient staging facility, as a short-term holding facility, as a sorting facility for a field hospital, Take a blood pressure on him. You're feeling no as a center for the treatment of special types of patients, as a PW camp facility, as a patient decontamination center, or as a medical station for a rear area group of units or installations. The company provides an austere treatment facility and it is capable of providing accommodation for up to 100 patients. Okay, let's get the, next one in. the ambulance transport companies are allocated on the basis of one per division and one per corps troops. They provide for the transport of patients and sustaining care while en route to rearward medical facilities and they assist the forward movement of medical material and personnel. The forward medical replenishment units are allocated on the basis of one per division and are assigned to the forward core medical groups. They issue medical material to units in the combat zone and carry out limited second line repairs to medical equipment. The laundry, bath, and decontamination companies are allocated on the basis of one per core medical group. In addition to their normal functions, they specialize in medical laundry techniques and provide decontamination support to groupings of medical units. An air ambulance squadron is allocated in support of each division. It provides for the aeromedical evacuation of patients, airlift of critically required medical supplies, the emergency movement of medical personnel, equipment, and supplies, and for the recovery of casualties from downed aircraft. The Corps Medical Support Battalion is made up of a number of technically independent elements which provide specialist medical support including a medical material and maintenance unit, a field laboratory, a preventive medicine unit, and medical specialist teams. The coordination and control of these elements is provided by the battalion headquarters and its services company provides for their first line support. The medical material and maintenance unit provides medical supplies and equipment to the forward medical replenishment units. 
and to other medical facilities within the combat zone. It also carries out repairs and maintenance on medical equipment and material. The field laboratory provides a full range of specialized diagnostic and research laboratory services, including water analysis, food tests and epidemiological investigations. In addition, it establishes a central blood bank and distribution facility in support of the blood management program. The Preventive Medicine Unit provides advice and assistance in the construction and maintenance of field appliances. It also conducts inspections and surveys, instructs in hygiene, in environmental health matters, and helps with pest control. Medical specialist teams augment units or installations which require additional personnel with specialized training and experience. These teams are not usually employed in providing routine services. Normally attached to a hospitalization facility, they may be assigned to a field medical company to form a special treatment center. In this case, administrative support from a host unit or installation is required. The siting of medical installations requires they normally be placed far enough to the rear to be relatively secure, technically accessible, and somewhat trauma-free. Yet at the same time, far enough forward to provide an acceptable time lag, usually six hours, between wounding and initial surgery. The forward deployment of hospitals presents problems of mobility, protection, and concealment, especially when the hospitals are active and crowded with patients. Facilities supporting a division are normally sited from 30 to 50 kilometers behind the forward edge of the battle area, with the forward surgical hospitals near the division administrative area, and the field hospitals deployed individually in depth along the division's main evacuation routes. In the rear area, facilities are grouped, whenever possible, into medical centers which comprise two or more field hospitals with the appropriate medical support elements. In specific situations when it is anticipated that the wounded will not reach a hospital within an acceptable time frame, surgical teams from field hospitals may be deployed forward to a brigade medical station or to a field medical company where they form an advanced surgical center. The tactical employment of the core medical resources cannot be dealt with in isolation from other aspects of medical support. Patient management, deployment procedures, and the siting of medical facilities must be considered concurrently with and as an integral part of the allocation and deployment of medical units in the combat zone. system of division replenishment utilizes delivery points with resupply activities for units taking place during the hours of darkness. Delivery points are designed to facilitate the replenishment of combat supplies and certain general and technical stores for battle groups or units. Their locations are based upon the need for dispersion of the delivery sites and any restriction on administrative movement in the forward area. Replenishment activities are aimed at the service battalion maintaining the unit's basic load of combat supplies, 
and other essential items of supply on a cyclical basis over a 24-hour period. Replenishment involves forecasts of issues from the division's maintenance load, which permits consolidation of division requirements. It also warns its replenishment point of anticipated draws during the forthcoming replenishment cycle. The cycle commences with the submission of unit demands to Service Battalion Logistic Operations Center via the Brigade Administrative Net or to the Service Battalion Supply Representative at the DP. These demands are made 24 hours in advance of the expected delivery. Two drums tonight. Demands are passed to the Supply and Transport Company Command Post where they are checked by the duty officer and passed to the Supply Platoon. Demands for stores not held by the platoon are forwarded via the Logistics Operations Center to the Disc Group Supply Battalion. Authority to release controlled stores is requested from the Brigade G3 through the G4. The Supply Platoon builds up unit stores lots from its holdings for pickup by the DP vehicles during the afternoon prior to delivery. Demands are segregated by categories into combat supplies, defense stores, general and technical stores, repair parts, and field force equipment table items. In the case of combat supplies, the supply and transport company CP warns its transport platoons of forecast unit requirements so that load planning, vehicle cross-loading activities, and preliminary DP orders may begin. At the same time, the battalion log op center prepares a consolidated forecast of combat supplies, which is passed to the division service group headquarters, and the RP is warned of the division's anticipated draw for that night. Unit operational requirements may change with the battle situation. These changes are handled by supplementary or emergency supply requests. Supplementary supply requests are usually expressed as deletions or additions to the stores and commodities previously demanded by units. Emergency supply requests are urgently required stores or supplies which were not previously demanded. They can be submitted at any time. If delivery cannot be accomplished on the next scheduled DP, then immediate delivery may be made to an emergency DP or direct to a unit location. It is the responsibility of the unit requiring resupply to select the locations and timings for the DP. Authority to use a piece of ground and access routes to it is provided by the brigade headquarters G3 staff. Requests and authorizations for DP locations and timings follow the administrative chain of command, from the unit to the Brigade Headquarters G4 staff and on to the Service Battalion Log Ops Center. On occasion, minor units or detached subunits may be grouped with a major unit for their replenishment requirements. When this is the case, affiliated units arrive at the DP site in accordance with predetermined timings. DP orders are prepared at the Supply and Transport Company CP. They contain preliminary information and an update on the tactical situation, DP locations and timings, route information and a commodities list, and radio frequencies, passwords, and available RP details and procedures. Concurrent activity within the company includes preparation of unit issue vouchers, advising the Log Op Center of special requirements for heavy lift at the DP, and finalizing arrangements to pick up defensive stores, repair parts, CF, FET items, and other stores. Okay, good. Simultaneously, vehicles are serviced, the drivers are fed and rested, Commodities and supplementary supply requirements are being loaded in preparation for that night's DP activity. Boy. 
In accordance with their timings, convoys leave for their respective DPs. The supply and transport company CP maintains radio contact with the convoys and keeps the log ops center posted on their progress and any changes in the tactical situation or any other factors which will affect the locations, routes or timings of the DPs. In the meantime, the unit DP reconnaissance and protection party arrives at the predetermined DP location in advance of the opening time. Factors to be considered in the sighting of a DP include reasonable proximity to the unit A echelon location, ease of access to the main supply route with at least two lead-in roads and identifiable contact points, lying up areas, sufficient maneuver area within the DP site, separate entrance and exit tracks, concealment, defense, hard standings, and any known enemy activity. On arrival at the lying up area, the service battalion DP party takes up a defensive posture. The DP commander meets with a unit representative at a contact point and proceeds with him to the DP location where he is briefed by the unit recce and protection party commander on the layout and defense of the DP and establishes his report okay. center. Behind us, and there's two to the rear. Okay. All well, unsecured. Okay. He returns to the lying up area where he briefs his company co-drivers on the layout of the DP. The DP is laid out to disperse dangerous goods and to provide for security. A DP layout will normally include an arrival lying up area, a DP report center, areas for salvage, mail, POL, rations, ammunition, general stores and repair parts, and a departure lying up area. The supply and transport company vehicles are then moved to the DP site using the out route and are positioned to accommodate tailgate to tailgate cross loading. The co-drivers return to the report center and wait to guide receiving unit vehicles to the appropriate commodity vehicles. The user unit A echelon vehicles have arrived at the report center, where they pick up their guides and move into the DP. Their vehicles are in reverse of their departure order, with the first vehicle going to the end of the line. The cross-loading process begins with the user unit providing the extra manpower needed for handling stores. The user unit and the service battalion supply representatives verify the stores being cross-loaded. The next night's demands are collected by the supply representative, which are later handed in to the supply and transport company CP. On completion of the store's handover, the DP is wrapped up and unit vehicles return to their echelon locations. The service battalion's convoy then proceeds to the RP to replenish that portion of the brigade maintenance load expended during that night's DP. The DP operation just described is one example. Actual procedures for any operation would be determined by brigade SOPs and the tactical situation. Occasionally, the tactical situation will require using a central DP to service several units. The employment of a central DP is particularly suited to situations when second line transport resources are elsewhere supporting a dumping program or when the task vehicle requirement to support a brigade move or troop lift disrupts the normal DP process. Aside from increased terrain requirements, the main difference in operation is the need for a timed program for each unit's activity. Defense of a central DP will be coordinated by the service battalion log ops center. The same DP layout principles apply in built-up areas. 
The greater spread of the DP will require more local control and additional guides to guard against confusion in narrow streets or lanes. In addition, battle damage may involve some route clearance activity. In certain tactical situations, a forward logistics group may be established. The FLG maintains a forward reserve and provides battle group commanders with immediate access to fast-moving combat supplies, primarily fuel and ammunition. The FLG location, commodities to be handled, and its operating times are determined by the Log Ops Center in consultation with Brigade Headquarters. Emptied vehicles from the FLG will be replaced with full vehicles from the Supply and Transport Company location. The DP system is tried and true and contains sufficient flexibility to satisfy the resupply needs of operational units. operation is a joint undertaking which employs transport aircraft to convey a combat force into an objective area where they are airdropped or air landed on or near their objective. Airborne operations are characterized by close and continuous joint cooperation, planning, and coordination including the exchange of liaison officers at various levels of command. A sound and simple plan is used, which will retain its structure irrespective of the difficulties involved. The establishment of a joint task force is essential for the planning and conduct of airborne operations. The joint task force commander commands all assigned elements and is responsible for directing and coordinating the operation, including the resupply and the link-up or extrication of the force. The airlift commander commands the airlift units and is responsible for the air movement stage of the operation. He determines the technical parameters of the lift, including the run-in direction and the marking of the DZs. Morning, sir. The airborne force commander carries out the mission and is responsible for the detailed planning and conduct of all activities relating to the airborne force, including the selection of the main assault and alternate DZs. The coordination of fire support is the responsibility of the task force artillery commander who operates from the force fire support coordination center. Fire support mainly involves in-range corps and division artillery. Close air support aircraft. Attack helicopters. And the airborne forces organic artillery and mortars. The fire plan is based on a timed program with support provided from outside elements until the force's artillery and mortars are operational and the objective area has been seized. Control of fire is initially exercised directly by the pathfinders, fire controllers and forward observation officers of the airborne force. After landing, the control of fire is exercised through the FSCC. Airspace control is affected through the appropriate theater agencies, which provide air corridors to the objective area and control zones covering the departure airfield and the objective airhead. Tactical air support plays a vital role in airborne operations. It encompasses photo reconnaissance missions, which provide air photos of the objective area including the DZ and the enemy positions. Missions allocated to suppression of enemy air defense fire, which are flown over the objective area just before the landing. 
close air support sorties, which may be employed to assist in isolating the objective area, especially with respect to any nearby enemy armor forces, and engaging any hardened point targets providing difficulties to the assault elements, and local air superiority, which must be achieved both en route to and over the objective area. Electronic warfare support may also be used to disrupt enemy communications and gain knowledge of the enemy's counterattack activities. Airborne forces incorporate characteristics which differentiate them from conventional forces, with emphasis being placed on the special spirit of the individual to complete the mission. They are adapted to move by transport aircraft over great distances, avoiding obstacles and achieving surprise. They are trained to react to a variety of operations with a minimum of delay and are lightly equipped to meet the requirements of the mission and the environment. They can be air landed or dropped by parachute and their light scales make them ideal for helicopter transported operations. They are capable of moving over difficult terrain on foot as a self-contained entity. Airborne forces can be effectively employed in areas which restrain the operations of conventional forces. Airborne forces pose a severe threat to enemy rear area installations, and their use can create a shock effect out of all proportion to their size, firepower, and numbers for a short period of time. Airborne forces suffer the inherent limitations of aircraft unserviceabilities, adverse weather and drop zone conditions, a lack of up-to-date and extensive intelligence, and heavy losses which can be occasioned by enemy fighters, air defense weapons, and ground fire. Airborne forces are vulnerable to counterattack by enemy mechanized elements, and will quickly feel the effects of any disruption in resupply operations. In addition, a delay in link-up, relief, or extrication will place the force at hazard. Thorough briefings also assist individuals to attain their objectives should they become dispersed or separated, with every paratrooper being prepared to carry on with his portion of the mission. SOPs allow for rapid reaction to a mission requirement and provide for essential control features, such as DZRVs, fire support coordination lines, link-up and extraction points, and key timings. Communications are a particular concern in an airborne operation. It should be assumed that the enemy will attempt to disrupt the main links and that key radios may not arrive or might be damaged during the drop. Minimum numbers of vehicle mounted radios will be available and reliance will have to be placed on manpack equipments and flare signals to help in communicating with the aircraft. The higher level radio communications requirements include the task force command net linking the Airborne Force Headquarters to the JTF HQ. The Force Administrative Net, to deal with resupply matters and aircraft movements. And the Force Fire Control Net, to coordinate all fire support requirements. In addition, at the airhead there would be various ground-to-air nets for control of arriving transport aircraft and close air support sorties. And internal command fire support and administrative nets to handle the needs of the landed force. Uh, eight, this is zero. Acknowledge my last over. The three major locations in an airborne operation involve the garrison location, the mounting base, and the objective area. The garrison location is the home base of the airborne force, encompassing its barracks, command and training facilities. It also includes the applicable base support infrastructure and communications, which serve to support the assembly, administration, and staging of the force. The base organizes personnel and technical departure assistance groups, which help prepare the force for its move. The mounting base includes the departure airfield, an operations site, transit camps, storage dumps, medical facilities, and the communications, administrative, and logistic services to support the operation. The objective area includes the airhead with its DZs, echelon site, 
and the force objectives. Planning for an airborne operation is carried out in the reverse order of execution. It involves the ground tactical plan, which assigns the objective and determines the combat force needed to accomplish the mission. The landing plan, which details the sequential delivery and assembly on the ground of the different components of the force and its equipment. The air movement plan, which provides the information on the movement of the force from the departure airfield to the drop or landing zones. And the mounting plan, which deals with marshalling of the force at the airhead, as well as the briefing and preparations for the operation and the loading of aircraft. The preparation for and execution of an airborne operation generally falls into four phases. The mounting phase starts with the receipt of the warning order or planning directive. During this phase, joint planning is completed. Troops, equipment and supplies are assembled and readied. And briefings and rehearsals are conducted. Marshalling also takes place and includes the movement of troops, supplies, and equipment to the mounting base, where they are loaded into transport aircraft. The air movement phase begins with the takeoff of the tactical transport aircraft from the departure airfield and involves a stream of aircraft carrying the assault, reserve, and support groups. It ends with the delivery of the last aircraft load to its designated drop zone or landing strip. This phase also includes the insertion of pathfinders, which are normally employed in advance of the assault force. A pathfinder group is allotted to each DZ. The group normally consists of a commander, a DZ controller, a fire controller, two recce detachments, and a signaler who handles the rear link communications. It might also include a medical assistant and an engineer recce and work party. Initially, the tasks of the pathfinders are to infiltrate the perimeter of the objective area, recce assigned locations, and to confirm the suitability of the DZs. During the para assault, they call in airstrikes and in-range artillery fire, assist with the control of the DZs, and provide security until the force can concentrate on the ground. If they cannot be inserted until just before the assault, their scope is limited to DZ control and the direction of any available fire support. The landing phase begins with a drop of the force on the DZ and extends through the securing and consolidation of the airhead. It also includes any elements which are air landed on a protected LZ. The ground tactical phase covers the employment of the force once it is on the ground and the subsequent land battle. The criteria for the selection of a drop zone includes the closeness of the DZ to the objective, which facilitates the recovery of stores and heavy equipment, and allows for the capture of the objective before the enemy has time to react. The size of the DZ, which must relate to the numbers of troops and stores being dropped. An area approximately 2,000 by 600 meters would be suitable as a main or alternate DZ. The surface of the DZ, which should be relatively level so as to reduce landing injuries and the complication of handling overturned platforms. Additional criteria involve the airlift force, which must be satisfied that they can locate and identify the DZ from the air under the expected visibility conditions. The location and strengths of enemy ground defenses, and particularly those which can interfere with the assembly and movement of the force, and the drop, which must take place clear of any enemy anti-aircraft weapons or where it is feasible to implement an intensive program to suppress enemy air defense weapon systems. The DZs are marked by pathfinders just prior to the arrival of the lead aircraft. They use a letter identifier which also locates the impact point. A lead-in marker may also be required. 
At night, these markings consist of colored lights or flares, and electronic aids assist in conditions of poor visibility. Extraction zones and landing strips involve the same fundamental criteria as DZs, but require additional marking. The impact area of an EZ is approximately 300 meters in length, not counting approach and climb-out zones. It is marked with a code identifier, release, impact, and climb panels. A landing strip requires at least 1,200 meters of usable runway length. It is marked with a coded identifier and with orange panels by day and green, red, and white lights at night. Smoke may be used to indicate wind direction and velocity. The main types of tasks assigned to an airborne force include seize and hold missions, area interdiction operations, and raids on enemy locations. A force may also be involved in air mobile, deep patrol, and rear area security operations. Seize and hold missions can be conducted close to the FIBA, well within range of artillery and attack helicopters, or in depth along an offensive axis. These missions involve a parachute or air-landed assault onto or as close as possible to an objective, seizing it and then reorganizing and holding until link-up or relief takes place. Assaults may be conducted against major road, bridge, defile, or urban locations that might prove to be a serious choke point to an advancing force. They could also secure landing areas, key terrain, and airfields as a phase of an offensive operation. An air-landed assault, or the immediate follow-up lifts to a parachute assault, involves tactical aircraft with combat-loaded troops ready to deplane into action. These troops are not normally expected to engage in combat immediately upon landing. Air-landed units are mainly made up of conventional forces, which must be trained and equipped for a lightly scaled operation. Air-landed elements should be offloaded as close as possible to the objectives to be engaged or to the troops being supported. Supplies and equipment are delivered at a pre-planned rate to locations on the airfield which will require a minimum of additional movement and handling. An air-landed operation would normally involve a specially trained Air Force air traffic control team, which is brought in as soon as the airstrip is serviceable. The team can be operational within two hours of landing. It provides for the control of all air traffic at the objective airfield including the provision of letdown, traffic pattern, taxi, and takeoff instructions. Area interdiction operations are planned at the highest level and are designed to prevent or hinder enemy activities within a given area. Interdiction operations involve raids, ambushes, mining, and sniping, which are mainly directed against industrial facilities, military installations, and enemy lines of communications. They cause the enemy to commit large forces for rear area security duties and generally have a demoralizing effect on his troops. These operations are best undertaken in terrain that restricts the off-road mobility of enemy forces and which favors concealment. Targets for interdiction operations include transfer points, tracks and rolling stock, vehicle compounds, aircraft and airfield facilities, shipping, port installations, as well as selected bridges and defiles, communication centers and transmission interlinks, power plants and transformer switching stations, fuel storage, refinery and pipeline equipments, key components of specialized industrial plants, and headquarters, military stores and maintenance entities. The area assigned to the interdiction force is divided into sectors with a subunit responsible for all operations within a given sector. The sectors provide space for maneuver to prevent the force from being trapped and to permit the early detection of enemy search and destroy parties. 
the force would normally enter the area with its accompanying supplies and facilities. Additional requirements would be later delivered to selected locations. Supply problems can be offset by using captured enemy stocks and by living off the land. Communications difficulties caused by the dispersion of the force can be eased by the use of long-range radios. Airborne raids are planned at the highest level and the size of the force is kept to the minimum. A raid constitutes a surprise attack by parachute or air-landed assault. It may operate independently or in conjunction with friendly guerrilla units. Objectives suitable for airborne raids may either be deep in enemy territory or relatively close to the FIBA. These include command posts and headquarters, communication centers, transport networks, airfield installations, key enemy personnel, supply installations and facilities, PW enclosures, intelligence targets and the like. The raiding force is generally organized into an assault element which accomplishes the mission, a support element which provides and coordinates the required support, a security element which seals off the objective, and a reserve. Airborne raids are preferably carried out in conditions of poor visibility which facilitate surprise. They are executed as swiftly as possible. The raiding force is either extricated before the enemy can react, or it may remain and carry out an area interdiction operation. The bulk of the airborne force's supplies are handled by their integral tactical air movement sections. These sections prepare cargo and equipment for delivery, assist with the loading and with the dispatch of airdropped stores, layout and mark follow-up cargo DZs and EZs, control activity on the ground, and help clear away cargo after the drop. Supplies provided to an airborne force are categorized as accompanying, follow-up, and routine supplies. Accompanying supplies are those carried by the troops in support of the assault. They are issued early to allow for their preparation for air movement. Accompanying supplies include loads which are carried on the individual, wedge loads which are dropped in conjunction with personnel, door loads which are pushed out ahead of a stick of paratroops, CCC-1 loads which are handled by aircraft equipped with a container delivery system, medium equipment loads that are gravity extracted from the aircraft ramp, and parachute extracted heavy equipment platforms that go in with the assault force. Accompanying supplies also include prescribed loads and any additional items which are brought into the airhead by oncoming echelons at their time of entry. Quantities and natures of follow-up supplies are based on an estimated daily expenditure and include on-call items which may be quickly provided to satisfy emergency requirements. They are delivered after the parachute assault in accordance with a planned program. In certain instances, Specialized natures of heavy bulk items such as ammunition would be dropped directly on the gun position to reduce ground handling. Routine resupply is a result of normal requisitioning procedures, replacing combat supplies and other stores which have been expended or to increase reserve stocks. These would normally be delivered by transport aircraft. All aircraft loads are inspected and certified by Air Force Air Movements personnel prior to loading. MAMS crews then move the loads to the aircraft, maneuver them aboard, and hook them up in accordance with the load table requirement. Airborne operations require considerable joint planning and control at all levels of command, and a great deal of material support. They are naturally risky and susceptible to the whims of weather, aircraft unserviceability, and to destruction by undetected enemy armored forces and air defense weapons. With sound intelligence, good planning, and the proper use of the force, 
an airborne operation can achieve results far exceeding the actual expenditure of resources. Regiment is the principal strike force of the brigade and is tasked with assault and counterattack, advance to contact, pursuit, covering force, and blocking operations. Tanks mount large caliber guns which are capable of firing armor defeating, high explosive, smoke, and canister ammunition. The use of a solid state fire control system incorporating laser ranging and a ballistic computer, image intensification and thermal imagery permit the tank to deliver accurate aimed fire during periods of limited visibility and it excels at destructive direct fire at hard and pinpoint targets while stationary or on the move. The tank's cross-country agility enables it to move and engage targets from a variety of fire positions, to avoid enemy ground observation and fire, traverse streams and rivers, and work their way across minefields. The tank's size and weight may, however, affect tactical plans by ruling out certain routes, while noise can preclude surprise. The tank's inherent armor protection affords it a good chance of survival against hits from enemy tanks, anti-tank and artillery fire. They are, however, vulnerable to short-range anti-armor fire, and supporting infantry are required to reduce this threat. 
tanks can operate effectively over contaminated ground and incorporate a protective system against fallout and chemical attack. Armor can be quickly concentrated and rapidly dispersed, and the point of an attack can be easily shifted without lengthy and detailed orders. Mission, call sign three will attack and destroy. Execution, a right flank. The fundamentals of employing armor dictate that tank operations must be executed with speed, resolution, and boldness. The basic fire unit is the tank troop, and the squadron is the basic maneuver unit. Tanks must be supported by infantry if they are required to hold ground for an extended period. The firepower of as many tanks as possible must be massed to produce a shock effect. The fire of one element must cover the movement of another. Ground must be chosen to provide maneuver room protection and concealment for tanks. Tanks always work in conjunction with infantry and with the support of other arms and armored operations consume significant bulk quantities of fuel and ammunition and consequently require adequate and timely resupply. The tank regiment is organized into a regimental headquarters, a reconnaissance troop, four tank squadrons, and a headquarters squadron. The regimental headquarters is kept small and is required to move frequently to avoid detection and to maintain communications. Its sighting should provide firm ground with concealment from the air and room for dispersion, good communications, accessibility to the main axis, and it should be defensible. The RHQ includes two command tanks, one which permits the CO to exercise command in the forward area, and the other covers the movement of his tank. Also in the RHQ location are the CO's rover, the regimental liaison officer, signal officer, and the regimental sergeant major. Two dispatch riders and a radio rebroadcast vehicle assist with communications, and a mobile repair team keeps the headquarters vehicles and radios operational. The regimental police section also works from this location and is tasked by the regimental operations officer. It is responsible for traffic control, PWs and detainees, police investigations, the enforcement of discipline, and liaison with the affiliated military police platoon. The hub of the headquarters are its two command post vehicles. The operations command post is manned by the regimental ops officer and his staff. They operate the command nets, maintain current operations information, maps and battle boards, and receive, action, log, and display relevant information. The regimental 2IC normally functions from the ops CP, where he monitors the ongoing activities and can quickly act in place of the CO when required. You can also get the dispositions for the forward brigade. The unit intelligence officer and his staff operate from the intelligence command post. In addition to their intelligence function, they're responsible for collecting and disseminating nuclear and chemical data, duplicating the operational information, and holding copies of up-to-date maps and logs. Good day, sir. Good, sir. Okay, we just had... Uh, Both CPs are identically equipped and staffed to permit control to shift smoothly from one vehicle to another during step-up operations. The regiment's reconnaissance troop is broken down into a headquarters and five patrols. The troop is normally grouped on a regimental task, reporting directly back to the RHQ. If required, some of its elements may be detached in support of the tank squadrons. Throughout all phases of operations, the reconnaissance troop is used to recce routes, hides, battle positions, assembly areas, and attack positions. The regiment's tank squadrons each include a small headquarters, four tank troops, and an administrative troop. The squadron is structured to fight as a single entity. As a fundamental, tanks are not allotted by half squadrons to different battle groups. Splitting the squadron in half or detaching troops must only be done after careful deliberation and with full acceptance of the risks of violating the basic principles of mass and concentration. The squadron commander operates from a command tank and his battle captain assists him from the squadron's second command tank. 
They both monitor the regimental or battle group and the squadron command nets, but with a different emphasis. The battle captain works the regimental zero, net, zero, keeping RHQ informed of the situation and passing on important information to the squadron commander, who is fully occupied on the squadron command net with the conduct of the ongoing battle. With three BMPs, uh, two now destroyed, and one tank still in position. A dozer tank travels with the headquarters group and is used mainly for improving routes and digging in fire positions. A liaison officer represents his commander at other headquarters, carries out reconnaissance, and helps with the control of movement. A dispatch rider assists with the squadron's communications. Each tank troop consists of four identically equipped tanks linked by radio. The troop leader's fundamental task is to maneuver and concentrate the fire of all of his tanks against the enemy. The tank squadron's administrative troop subdivides into A1, A2, and B echelon elements. The squadron's A1 echelon is deployed one or two bounds to the rear of its F echelon. It is kept as small as possible, providing for the squadron's immediate needs in battle. The A1 echelon is commanded by the squadron sergeant major and typically includes an armored recovery vehicle, two APC ambulances, POL and ammunition vehicles, four mobile repair teams composed of vehicle, weapons, fire control systems, and radio repair technicians, the squadron commander's rover, and mine roller and plow carrying vehicles. Further back, the squadron's A2 and B echelon elements are normally centralized within the regimental A2 and B echelons. The squadron's A2 echelon is commanded by the squadron's second in command. It normally incorporates an ambulance, BOL and ammunition vehicles, and mobile repair teams. The B echelon element is commanded by the squadron quartermaster sergeant. It includes kitchen, baggage, stores, and any other vehicles not required forward. Normal deployment of the regiment's administrative resources involve individual squadron A1 echelons operating under squadron control and centralized A2 and B echelons functioning under regimental control. The administrative system is designed to ensure that F echelon is topped up with combat supplies at every opportunity. Critical repairs are carried out well forward enabling individual tanks to continue the fight, and that personnel and vehicle casualties are quickly evacuated rearward. The regiment's three-day basic load of combat supplies is split, with one day's holdings held by the various F echelons, the squadron A echelons, and the regimental A2 echelon. Replenishment of combat supplies and other commodities is conducted as required in battle, on a daily basis or in concert with a dumping operation. Headquarters squadron comprises a logistics troop, a maintenance troop, a transport troop, and an administrative troop. It contains the bulk of the regiment's administrative resources, which are divided between the A2 and B echelon locations. The squadron establishes an echelon control command post in the regimental A2 echelon area and coordinates ongoing combat service support for the regiment. Sir, no enemy in the area. The area is secure, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. The regimental A2 echelon is commanded by the headquarters squadron 2IC. Yeah, this is one too it holds the balance of the regiment's basic load of combat supplies not carried by the squadrons. It includes stores and spare parts vehicles, the maintenance troops' specialized shop and heavy lift vehicles, and any MRTs that are not deployed forward. Also in the A2 echelon location is the headquarters squadron A1 echelon, which serves RHQ, the recce troop, any deployed MRTs, the squadron A2 echelon groupings, and the regimental medical station, which includes tracked and wheeled ambulances, and a medical stores vehicle. The regimental chaplains normally work at the RMS and visit other regimental elements as time and the situation permit. The regimental B echelon, sited in the brigade administration area, 
includes those personnel, vehicles, and equipment not required in F or A echelons. It is the direct link with the service battalion and assists in assuring the regimental needs are met. The B echelon is commanded by the unit quartermaster and typically consists of some maintenance elements, finance cell, kitchens, QM stores, orderly room, and the squadron's B echelon elements. Postal services are provided through the unit B echelon orderly room, where mail is sorted and distributed downward to the squadron. It is here that replacements join the regiment. The maintenance organization within the regiment includes a regimental maintenance troop split between A2 and B echelons and a maintenance section in the A1 echelon of each squadron. The regimental maintenance troop provides first-line maintenance of unit equipment including repair, servicing and inspections, recovery, modifications and repair parts scaling. The tank squadron's maintenance section is made up of mobile repair teams which can handle a limited range of first-line repairs to the squadron's vehicles and equipment. The regiment holds a 15-day expected usage of repair parts. Each repair section and MRT deploys with a small holding of likely spares needed for on-site repairs. Harbors are used by the regiment's subunits throughout any given phase of operations. These are temporary areas which permit elements to carry out replenishment, maintenance, rest, or other related activities. They are occupied when enemy interference is considered unlikely. The essential characteristic of a harbor is concealment from enemy ground and air observation. Other features include adequate space for dispersal, ground suitable for the movement and parking of vehicles, good entrances and exits, a site which permits good radio communications, and a location that is defensible with good fields of fire. Built-up areas provide good concealment from enemy visual observation and electronic surveillance, particularly when vehicles are blended with shadows or parked inside buildings. Tracks are easy to conceal, and hard-surfaced areas are available for administration and maintenance. Dispersion may be greater than in a wooded area, which, along with the presence of any civilians, will pose additional security problems. Hides and sniping positions are normally used in conjunction with the defense. A hide is a location that is occupied by a troop or squadron where they wait for the order to move into battle or sniping positions. The characteristics of a hide are similar to that of a harbor. Maintenance or replenishment are not normally conducted in a hide. Sniping positions are occupied to prevent the primary battle position from being prematurely disclosed or to achieve long-range attrition of the enemy. They are normally outside of and generally forward of a battle position. A troop or occasionally individual tanks may be deployed forward in a sniping role. During defensive operations, the regiment may be employed to execute deliberate and hasty blocking tasks between and behind defended areas. These are based upon a number of squadron battle positions which cover the killing zone and its approaches. Troops may be assigned both primary and secondary battle positions. These are cited to be defilated from the enemy and to achieve enfilade fire. They must be large enough to allow for deployment in depth and to permit jockeying and must have wide fields of fire. Continuous surveillance of battle positions and the approaches to them must be maintained to ensure early warning of enemy movement. The routes from hides to battle positions must also be patrolled. Fire planning includes defensive fire for the battle positions and their associated hides and covering fire for all movement. The regiment is well suited to execute one or more counter-attack tasks during the conduct of a defense. These may be assigned in conjunction with a blocking or reinforcing mission. Normally, the task of providing intimate support to the infantry in a defended area is provided by a tank squadron as part of an infantry battle group. The battle group commander allots tasks to the squadrons, designates killing zones and approaches, which are to be covered by fire. Dismounted infantry must provide for the local protection of the tanks. How you doing, Nick Martin, sir, Patricia? Robert, put some 
Armor can best contribute to the defense when joint armored and infantry reconnaissance is carried out at all levels. The tank regiment, because of its inherent characteristics, is ideally suited for offensive operations. During a brigade advance to contact, the regiment would likely be tasked to provide the main component of the advance guard. The lead squadrons move by bounds over a wide front, ideally only encountering enemy which has been previously reported and picketed by the covering force. Lead squadrons will normally bypass the enemy. Depth squadrons move from waiting area to waiting area or by bounds depending on the cover and anticipated or known enemy action. They are prepared to attack or assume the picketing of any enemy that has been bypassed. The regiment could also be tasked to form one of the battle groups and the squadron would be combined with infantry elements into combat teams to directly attack the enemy. Tanks with the assault force are required to break into the enemy defenses providing intimate support to the infantry as they destroy the enemy. Others provide direct fire support to the troops fighting up to and through the objective and engage enemy armor and anti-armor weapons. They also ensure that the objective remains isolated when the assault force can no longer be covered by the fire base. Protection is provided until such time as the objective is consolidated and additional support weapons have been moved forward. During the pursuit, tanks are used to maintain pressure against the enemy, to encircle or separate his forces, and to block his withdrawal. Throughout all operations, under all battlefield conditions, the tank regiment is organized and equipped to provide the brigade commander with a mobile, protected, and Story flexible one, strike force. Uh, the other has reversed back into the low ground behind the crest to M observing over. Its proper employment will assist in achieving victory in battle. Battlefield deception operations are designed to mislead the enemy and induce him to react in a manner prejudicial to his interests. They're implemented to gain surprise, maintain security, hide our intentions from the enemy, persuade the enemy to adopt disadvantageous courses of action which can be exploited, and most importantly, to save lives of our own troops while minimizing the expenditure of time and effort. Deception operations are planned at the highest possible level and are carefully scripted and tightly controlled. They must be realistic and laid out in such a way as to present the events to the enemy as he would expect to receive them and to fit these events logically into the conduct of an operation. Deception actions must be timed to correspond to those of real operations and the activity must be capable of being altered or discontinued without drawing the attention of the enemy. A successful deception operation involves feeding pieces of information to the enemy in such a way as to convince him that he has discovered them by accident. As you know, the only troops the enemy division right commander must attack. believe that our attack forces will concentrate here and use this bridge and the Byfield Road as the main axis of advance to an assault on Hill 183. He must believe this not later than 72 hours prior to commencement of our offensive and must retain this belief until we kick off our attack down here in the Waterville area. The deception target is the mind of the enemy commander who controls army, division or regimental operations including second echelon forces. He has the authority to make the decisions which will lead to the fulfillment of the deception aim. His decisions are normally made in conjunction with advice received from his intelligence staff, which is supported by a broad database 
had extensive surveillance and reconnaissance assets. To achieve the deception objective, we inject false truths in the enemy's decision-making process. These distort the ability of the enemy commander and his staff to see and to respond to the true current situation. This distortion is accomplished by many means, including portrayal of false friendly intentions, capabilities and dispositions, which cause the enemy commander to make the wrong tactical decisions. Deception can be carried out at strategic, operational and tactical levels. Strategic deception is designed to mislead the enemy on the time, place, strength and nature of intended operations at the highest level. Operational deception covers measures to mislead the enemy about the conduct of friendly operations at corps, army, army group and theater levels. Tactical deception incorporates all measures to mislead the enemy on the battlefield and are normally planned at division and brigade level and below. Based on his estimate of the situation, the commander determines his deception objective. A deception plan is then prepared by the G3 staff and is supported by the other staff branches. They provide advice on and detailed planning of the deception operation, especially the G2 staff, who review the characteristics, capabilities, and employment of the enemy's information and intelligence gathering systems and how they work. The artillery, engineer, and signal staffs coordinate any required specialist deception measures, while the G4 staff provides the logistic support for the planned operation. Deception operations are classified as feints, demonstrations, ruses, portrayals, or displays. Feints are attacks which have limited objectives. These vary in size from a raid to a fully supported attack and are presented to the enemy during offensive operations as an indicator of the main effort. Feints are used prior to, during, or after the main attack to cause the enemy to move his reserve or keep it in a location where it cannot influence the main battle. To keep uncommitted forces in their present location. To divert some of his supporting fire from the main attack. To reveal his defense fire plan and supporting weapons locations. And to change his plans and disrupt the continuity of his operation. A demonstration is a show of force conducted in an area away from the main attack. It involves simulation devices rather than real equipment. It's less convincing than a feint, since it does not involve contact with the enemy. Demonstrations are used when time and distance factors can be applied to the show that makes the lack of contact realistic. Ruses are tricks designed to deceive the enemy and are characterized by deliberately exposing false information. Ruses include such activities as changing of traffic signs, raising columns of dust, increasing traffic levels, bringing down artillery fire, or initiating patrol activities in an area other than that in which the main effort will be made. Portrayals present a unit to the enemy which does not exist, or which is of a different type than actually does exist. This type of deception activity requires a considerable amount of background coordination and is beyond the capability of the division. Displays present disguises and decoys to the enemy. Disguises are employed to make something look like something else. Many military installations and objects are extremely difficult to conceal but can be disguised. They can also be used to make high-value targets appear to be of little or no value. Decoys project replicas of equipment or systems onto the battlefield. They aid in deception by drawing the enemy's attention away from a more important area and provide something for the enemy's intelligence system to find. 
They can also be used to draw enemy fire, deceive as to the numbers of friendly weapons, troops, or equipment, to add realism to a deception story, to replace withdrawn equipment, and to provide false terrain and equipment relationships. Decoys must be located in logical positions, far enough away from actual targets to prevent their being hit by fire directed at the decoy. To be effective, decoys must be realistic, using real troops whenever possible. For example, a decoy such as a command post must have the associated vehicle and foot tracks, tents, an antenna array, field phone lines, wire, slit trenches, generators, occasional lights, noise, heat sources, and a reasonable level of personnel and vehicle traffic. It should be constructed so that its disclosure appears to result from ineffective camouflage and poor track discipline. There are many and varied measures which may be used to support deception plans. Simple measures which fall within the scope of unit self-help are generally short-term in nature and may involve the use of local resources in civilian vehicles, empty ammunition and ration boxes, decoy mirrors, lights, noise and heat sources, dummy trenches sighted in likely but unheld places, phony protective minefields, false signs and markers, a simulation of gun barrels and vehicles, and blending into the civilian background. More difficult measures are required to create dummy company group battery and specialist weapons positions. The measures involve real equipment and manpower along with stores and equipment to support the deception. Sufficient time must be allotted to construct the position and it may have to be relocated to retain credibility. A deception plan in support of a deliberate brigade attack requires even more complex measures and a greater assignment of troops and equipment. Here, the aim of the deception is to divert the enemy's attention and forces away from the area of main thrust. For instance, a battle group that has been tasked as the deception force in concert with an upcoming operation might be supported by artillery, engineers and some helicopters. Deception measures will necessarily involve the use of electronic warfare operations to produce intelligence on the target, his knowledge, intentions and expectations to help counter enemy surveillance and to convey false information to a wide range of sources. Deception planners must remember that the battlefield information that the enemy has collected electronically must agree with what he has seen, heard, and smelled. Some additional measures that will normally accompany a deception include camouflage, smoke, people and things, smells, heat, and noise. Camouflage, in addition to hiding the evidence of the real operation, can be used to deliberately expose what we want the enemy to observe. Smoke can be used to conceal equipment and unit activity, to simulate installations or situations where smoke would be used, to blind enemy observers, and to simulate damage, mist, and ground haze. Specifics of people and things will give a degree of realism to the deception which will be difficult for the enemy to overlook. They must, of course, be in line with the deception activity. Battlefield smells, such as those associated with cooking, artillery fire, fuel dumps, and the like, must be consistent with other deception indicators. Battlefield noise and heat sources also assist in projecting the deception and must reinforce what the enemy sees. Wherever possible, they should portray the real sound and should originate from logical places. 
Battlefield deception operations are an effective way to achieve a degree of surprise and tactical advantage over the enemy. Whenever possible, the commander and his staff should incorporate deception activities into combat operations. The ultimate aim is to negate the enemy's choice of the time and place of battle and provide our commanders the optimum use of all available combat resources. Brigade Reconnaissance Squadron conducts medium reconnaissance for the brigade and is assisted by the close reconnaissance elements of the tank regiment, engineer units, and infantry battalions. The squadron is organized into a headquarters, free reconnaissance troops, a support troop, and an administrative troop. It is mounted in fast, agile vehicles, which are lightly armored for self-protection. These are equipped with extensive communications facilities, allowing control of a large number of dispersed elements operating over a wide area. The firepower and protection limitations of the command and reconnaissance APC do not permit the squadron to engage in close combat operations with armored enemy reconnaissance elements or main force organizations. The tactics employed by the squadron are constrained by these limitations and necessarily only involve observing, reporting, maintaining contact, and providing warning. To accomplish more, tanks, artillery, anti-armor, and infantry weapons must be grouped in support of its activities. The squadron headquarters contains the personnel and equipment required for the command and control of a squadron, and any elements placed under command or in support of its operations. It collects, verifies, and briefly collates information, then passes it on to the brigade headquarters. The headquarters functions under the direction of the battle captain, who is responsible for its layout, defense, and general activity. The core of the squadron headquarters is the command post complex, which is made up of the operations and intelligence APCs. The CP complex operates under the detailed direction of the battle captain, who is assisted by the operations warrant officer, the signal sergeant, the intelligence sergeant, and, when available, the squadron liaison officer. The battle captain functions as the primary duty officer in the squadron CP, drafts operational staff work, stages orders groups, and generally assists the squadron commander with all aspects relating to the operational function of the squadron. The operations warrant officer runs the command posts and generally assists the battle captain by looking after the detailed security of the headquarters, preparing duty rosters, and organizing personnel for moves. He's also employed on a shift in the command post. The signal sergeant advises the squadron commander on all signal matters, supervises voice procedure, handles codes in speech security equipment, looks after the user maintenance of all communications equipment, assists with the recce of new headquarters sites, and is employed as a duty officer in the squadron CP. The intelligence sergeant operates from the other CP processing and disseminating information preparing maps and traces, updating enemy orbats, working up intelligence briefings, and arranging for disposal of captured documents and prisoners. He ensures that any acquired information of intelligence value is passed back quickly to Brigade HQ, and that pertinent intelligence received from higher and flanking headquarters is made available within the squadron. He functions as the squadron NBC representative, and takes on a duty shift in the CP when required. The squadron liaison officer represents the squadron commander at brigade or other headquarters, where he provides advice on recce matters. He remains in communication with the squadron on the command net. Within the squadron, there are three identical reconnaissance troops, 
each deploying into three patrols, each of two vehicles, and a troop leader in command. One element acts as a leg on the ground in visual contact with the other, observing, reporting, and if required, providing covering fire for the other while it withdraws or maneuvers. The support troop provides personnel, vehicles, and equipment for surveillance, as well as limited pioneer support to the reconnaissance troops. Its four sections are supported by dozer APCs, each equipped with ground surveillance radar, infrared scopes, thermal imaging devices, and a variety of tools and explosives. The administrative troop consists of the vehicles and equipment to provide the required combat service support to the squadron. Helicopters from the assigned observation squadron will normally be grouped in direct support. Wherever possible, they operate in pairs as fully integrated members of the ground patrol team. They function in a manner similar to the vehicle patrols and are mainly used to recce areas that the patrols cannot easily penetrate. Their vulnerability to enemy ground fire requires them to be kept back from the forward line owned troops and they normally do not operate forward of their ground partners. Other attachments may be grouped with the squadron in accordance with the assigned task. The squadron's movement on the battlefield is carefully controlled and coordinated by measures which can be easily referred to on the radio. These measures involve boundaries, an axis of advance, assembly areas, contact points, harbors and waiting areas, objectives, phase and report lines, reference points, line of departure, timings, and the order of march. Four two, this is four two Charlie. The primary means of communication is by combat net radio. Information to be of value must be passed quickly and efficiently. Considerations of sighting, antenna configurations, radio rebroadcast, and manual relay procedures must be continuously balanced with the tactical deployment requirements of the patrol. Radios include A sets and remotes for operating on the squadron net. B sets for monitoring other nets and for man pack operations. C sets on the guard frequencies, HF man packs for special needs, and UHF man pack sets for communications with fighter ground attack aircraft. The squadron administrative troop is organized into an A1 echelon, an A2 echelon, and a B echelon. The A1 echelon contains those elements required for the immediate resupply of troops in combat. It is normally commanded by the squadron sergeant major and moves in close proximity to F echelon. A1 echelon can function as a single entity or be split up to operate in different locations, delivering combat supplies to F echelon elements. Once the F echelon has been resupplied, the A1 echelon replenishes its holdings by exchanging empty for full vehicles at an RV with the A2 echelon. Under given circumstances, a helicopter resupply operation might be used to replenish the A1 or F echelon. The A2 echelon normally replenishes its holdings at a delivery point. The A2 echelon is not immediately required for the conduct of operations. It is composed of a small headquarters element, radio and line repair, maintenance and stores detachments carrying combat supplies. The squadron's 2IC commands A2 Echelon, issues the necessary administrative orders, controls the Echelon service support activity, and coordinates delivery operations. The A2 Echelon is normally located with a tank regiment's A2 Echelon. The squadron's B echelon is located with the B echelon of the tank regiment in the brigade administrative area. 
It comprises vehicles and stores not essential to the conduct of a battle. The echelon is commanded by the SQMS, who monitors the routine needs of the Reiki squadron. Resupply within the squadron utilizes the standard echelon system. The troops carry their basic load of combat supplies and are augmented to provide an increased degree of security when required to remain in place over a long period. In addition, small dumps can be arranged to assist with support of these elements. The ammunition and POL carriers of A echelon may carry mixed loads and can be attached to each troop. Resupply can be greatly assisted by the use of bulk refueling when the tactical situation permits. The squadron's maintenance load is carried on wheels and is split between the squadron's A1, A2 and B echelons. When daily forward resupply is difficult, A1 echelon's holdings of combat supplies may have to be augmented by additional vehicles. In all operations, the use of helicopters may greatly assist the resupply effort, as the transport of POL and several boxes of ammunition to an isolated patrol will save both time and effort. Great care is required and good tactical procedures must be practiced, so as not to give away operational locations during any resupply activity. The squadron has its own maintenance section, with technicians who are responsible for first-line repairs to the squadron's equipment. If the repairs are beyond their scope, the service battalion's MRTs are brought in to work in situ whenever possible, or to backload the equipment to a workshop, or to an equipment collecting point. Casualty evacuation is a major problem due to the rather large area of operations the vulnerability of the dispersed patrols and the fact that discrete operations may require that some casualties have to remain in location for longer periods than normally expected. The main means of evacuation include patrol vehicles, helicopters, tracked ambulances and any echelon vehicles. The Brigade Reconnaissance Squadron is very mobile, with excellent communications, some armored protection, and very limited firepower. It provides the Brigade Commander with the means of filling the information void between his forward battle groups and any opposing enemy forces. Reconnaissance Squadron conducts close reconnaissance within the brigade area of influence, obtaining information on the enemy and on the ground, and passing it back quickly to brigade headquarters. 
It is tasked by the brigade commander in very general terms and is normally allowed wide freedom of action to accomplish its mission. Reconnaissance operations are categorized as route, area, or point recce activities. Route recce operations are conducted to rapidly gather information on the route, obstacles, the enemy, and on adjacent terrain. They will likely take place along a major axis, withdrawal, or counterattack route. The squadron can recce up to two routes concurrently, if they are parallel and in reasonable proximity to each other, while still maintaining a reserve force for picketing of bypassed enemy elements. A recce is being conducted along Hart Route in support of the brigade advance against an enemy flank. It is being undertaken with one recce troop on either side of the main axis, each with a section from the support troop. As they proceed, they recce woods, hills and towns dominating the route, and any critical points such as river crossings that are within their assigned block of terrain. Urban areas are normally bypassed unless they must be checked for their potential as a defile or if they are occupied as a strong point. Engineer recce parties would be attached to the troops when there is a requirement for detailed bridge structure or obstacle classification along the route. The third troop and the support troop follow along the main axis to provide depth or they may be tasked to perform other recce duties. The squadron is being supported by two sections of helicopters. They provide rapid wide area coverage and can assist in watching lateral approaches, exits from the main towns and gaps not being covered by the squadron. Command and control measures must not be so numerous as to clutter maps rendering them unreadable. Reporting is by radio and additional details can be added following the completion of the task. An area recce operation is a time-consuming activity which obtains brigade-specified intelligence on the enemy and ground along a wide corridor in advance of the brigade. It requires all squadron resources to be deployed forward. Enemy locations will be identified, picketed, and handed over to follow up battle groups. As it may be practically impossible for the squadron to maintain an effective reserve, an additional force may have to be made available from outside resources. An area recce operation is being conducted with three troops up, each with an assigned element of a support troop. The squadron is supported by a flight of helicopters, which will help accelerate the operation. Various control measures have been identified, such as intertroop boundaries, report lines, junction and reference points. The frontage assigned to each troop varies from two to four kilometers. During his orders, the squadron commander has stressed the areas where enemy might be expected and other points of specific interest. Liaison has been completed with the lead battle group to cover any gaps that might be created between the squadron and the main body and to ensure the flanks are supported. In addition, the squadron will likely be required to man various junction points along the brigade boundary. Fire planning in support of the operation has included a selection of on-call artillery targets and close air support missions. The troops carry on with their tasks, quickly identifying and reporting all enemy activity in the sector. Their picketing is coordinated with follow-on battle groups. A point recce operation is carried out in conjunction with other tasks and involves reaching the location without delay, bypassing and reporting any enemy encountered en route. It acquires detailed information on a crossing site, a built-up area, or the like. A typical point reconnaissance operation might involve proceeding to and carrying out a reconnaissance of a location suspected of being hit by a gas attack, determining the extent and type of contamination, and reporting on any enemy attempt at its occupation. Important factors involved in a point recce operation include a detailed map study of the Route 2 and the location to be recce. The need for speed predominates the requirement to conduct a thorough en route recce. The recce force cannot become pinned down while en route to its location. Helicopters will speed up progress to the location and once there they can help watch for the enemy. 
Once in the location, the reconnaissance must proceed with speed and thoroughness. Approaches to the location must be watched. Contact must be maintained by radio throughout, and artillery support would help in ensuring the progress of the troop, while it is within the range of the guns. The squadron's primary tasks are reconnaissance and surveillance. Reconnaissance involves obtaining information on enemy activities and resources, or to secure data on the characteristics of a particular area or location. Surveillance involves a systematic watch over the battle area to provide information for combat intelligence. The squadron also performs other tasks, such as providing a screen, carrying out flank surveillance, acting as a flank guard that is suitably reinforced, carrying out rear area security duties, effecting liaison for passage of lines, conducting radiological and chemical reconnaissance, assisting with traffic control, and convoy, VIP, and PW escorts. A screen observes, identifies, and reports on the enemy. It does not have the integral capability to impose delay, but can employ indirect fire, air, or aviation resources to effect delay on the enemy. The squadron survives through its use of mobility, ground cover, and concealment. Attached observation helicopters considerably enhance its mission effectiveness. In the defense, the screen provides the brigade commander with continuous information on the approaching enemy by establishing a total observation over the area, and particularly on the major approaches. The squadron sets up an OP line to cover major and any secondary approaches, and patrols the areas not covered by observation. It coordinates with the withdrawing covering force, develops its own fire plan, and organizes the withdrawal of the screen. The task involves accurate and timely reporting, maintaining contact with the enemy, avoiding firefights, and using indirect fire to engage the enemy at a distance. The screen is deployed 6 to 15 kilometers beyond the FIBA, covering a frontage of 10 to 15 kilometers. The squadron is thus usually found with most of its resources deployed forward, with three recce troops up and the support troop in depth. Altogether, the recce troops can man a total of nine OPs for prolonged periods, but may double this number for periods of up to 12 hours. The support troop can augment the OP line with an additional four observation posts. Alternatively, one or more of its sections can be employed to patrol a likely area of enemy infiltration. Helicopters can assist in covering the area between the OP line and the FIBA and help maintain contact with infiltrating enemy recce elements. In an emergency, they can function as static OPs during hours of darkness or in very poor visibility conditions. Helicopters can also provide assistance during the withdrawal of the screen by reccying withdrawal routes and providing rapid liaison for passage of lines. Flank surveillance involves establishing a mobile screen to maintain surveillance over the area between the main body and the enemy. This action can be assisted by close liaison with the flank guard battle group, augmenting the squadron with helicopter support, adding directly to its firepower, and by increasing the allocation of artillery. In providing for flank surveillance, a series of picket positions are established on likely approaches between the main body and the enemy. These positions keep pace with the main body by leapfrog or caterpillar movements from location to location. Two troop sectors can be occupied at any given time with a third troop moving at best speed to a new location where it establishes observation along a designated approach. The squadron HQ moves along the axis while the support troop and helicopters patrol the area between the main body and the troop locations, maintaining observation over the approach that has just been vacated by the recce troop. Additionally, the thoroughness of the squadron operation will be influenced by the presence of the enemy, the speed of the advance, and the degree of warning provided of an enemy approach. The fire plan must cover targets visible from the OP line and from any helicopters operating within the area between the main body and the screen. And consideration may be given to attaching elements of the support troop to each recce troop, or to employ it as an additional recce force. 
Should the squadron be tasked as a flank guard, it must be reinforced. These additions could include anti-armor, attack helicopters, tanks, or infantry. The squadron will be required to impose delay on the enemy's advance by stopping the flank threat or causing him to deploy. The squadron would normally deploy each of its recce troops to an area which is occupied in depth, or it can provide a light screen across the flank, along with a grouping of in-depth blocking positions. Depending on terrain, the squadron could be located five to eight kilometers from the main body, and its elements maneuvered from position to position. The support troop and the attached helicopters would likely be employed to provide surveillance of the area between the screen and the main body. Rear area security operations would likely involve protecting against enemy attacks by airborne, air mobile, or guerrilla forces in the formation's rear area. Taskings could include the protection of key installations, units, and lines of communication, the denial of DZs and LZs, locating and destroying stay behind and guerrilla forces, action against breakthrough forces, area damage assessment, traffic control, and convoy escort. A rear area security deployment plan could involve surveillance over portions of the rear area, establishing OPs to cover designated areas, positioning a rapid reaction troop, which can be dispatched to counter any threat, confirming the designation of units to provide reinforcements, patrolling the MSR in conjunction with the MPs, providing listening posts and additional patrols throughout the brigade rear area providing troops for convoy escort duties, and checking specified locations for NBC contamination. Another deployment possibility includes dividing the rear area into sectors, with each sector being the responsibility of a recce troop, and employing the support troop as the rapid reaction force. Other activities that might also involve the squadron would include liaison with civil agencies, imposition of light policies and strict security of all unit locations, communication tests and warning or reaction rehearsals, and maintenance of movement discipline throughout the area. Should the enemy employ chemical or nuclear weapons on the battlefield, the squadron would have a function in the monitoring and reconnaissance of contaminated sites for chemical and radiological hazards. The task of monitoring would be performed on a continuing basis by patrols, OPs, or individual vehicles in conjunction with their normal reconnaissance tasks. The squadron will report the results to the NBC control center at brigade headquarters. The squadron's procedures, planning and execution of a nuclear or chemical reconnaissance are similar to an area recce with the particular purpose of establishing the extent of contamination, searching for routes around a contaminated area, determining the accessibility of routes within the stricken area, and reporting on damage resulting from the attack. Should the squadron be tasked to conduct a survey of a contaminated area, the troops would be involved in confirming the boundaries and determining the levels of contamination at locations which are of particular interest in the conduct of future operations, and locating, defining, and signing hotspots on given routes. Helicopters can greatly assist both the reconnaissance and survey effort by providing general information on the extent of the contaminated area. The squadron may also be involved in NBC-oriented tasks, such as determining and reporting on the fighting capability of a unit hit by a strike, establishing communications between an attack unit and its next higher headquarters, helping to assemble survivors and forming them into fighting elements, assisting in casualty evacuation and helping with evacuation of equipment and personnel to decontamination points, augmenting traffic control resources of the military police, and performing operational decontamination on its personnel and equipment. When undertaking traffic control tasks, the squadron would be involved in ensuring columns follow the prescribed route and block timings. 
preventing unauthorized military and refugee traffic from interfering with scheduled movement. Reconnaissance of detours and direction of traffic over them if the recognized route becomes blocked. Keeping in touch with and reporting on the progress of current movement. Helping to transmit and affect any alterations in orders to columns, packets or serials. And reporting on the state of roads. When involved in traffic control operations, the squadron could be tasked to provide the regulating headquarters which would run the movement operation in the brigade area. Several sector headquarters to assist with the direction of traffic. Individual traffic posts, which would identify and log each packet as it goes through, advise column commanders of any changes, and regulate the entry of units along the route in accordance with the movement plan. And liaison detachments at higher formation agencies and at key locations to deal with problems surrounding the reconnaissance of routes and the loss of communication during moves. Additionally, the squadron will likely be required to establish communications with the start and release points and with brigade headquarters. Helicopters can be used to back up communications for liaison and to monitor movement along the route. Prior to the move, alternate routes and assembly areas would be recce. Some elements will be maintained to respond to problems as required. The squadron could be tasked to provide a force for convoy escort duties. This force would be deployed into three tactical groups. The advance group, or leading element, which proves the safety of the route, provides warning and recce detours. The close protection group, which is spread throughout the column and provides for its security. It could include the escort commander and elements from the support troop. And the reserve group, which is the immediate reaction force, providing rear guard protection and recovery support as required. Prior to departure, the escort commander ensures the column's vehicles are in an acceptable state of serviceability that all personnel are briefed on anti-ambush drills and march discipline. The Brigade Reconnaissance Squadron is a very flexible organization with the inherent mobility that allow for its rapid response to new or unforeseen tasks. It is a valuable addition to the brigade's combat capability.
The artillery brigade is integral to the division and is often referred to as division artillery. Its structure consists of a division artillery headquarters, a headquarters and signal squadron, one close support medium regiment for each brigade, a general support heavy regiment, a multiple launch rocket regiment, a target acquisition battery, and an air defense regiment. The commander division artillery operates between his headquarters and the fire support coordination center at division main HQ. He provides advice to the division commander on all artillery matters including the employment of field, locating and air defense artillery resources, fire support coordination, artillery intelligence, and on the suppression of enemy air defense fire. Division artillery headquarters breaks down into G3, G2, and G1, G4 staffs. The G3 artillery organizes day-to-day -day activities of the division artillery headquarters staff directs the functioning of the G3 staff and provides the overall direction to the fire support coordination center. He represents the CDA when the latter is away from his headquarters. The G3 staff comprises an operations cell, a plans cell, and an air defense cell. It also includes instructor and liaison teams. The artillery operation cell functions within the division FSCC under G3 RT Ops. Its responsibilities include control of indirect fire, management of ammunition, direction of the division artillery command nets, movement and deployment of artillery resources, maintenance of charts and records, and the coordination of fire support activities. This area here. The artillery plan cell provides a representative to the division FSCC and is headed by the G3 RT plans. It is responsible for all aspects of upcoming artillery operations, including the allocation and allotment of artillery units, the deployment of resources, and the assignment of general tasks. The air defense cell is formed by the tactical headquarters of the air defense regiment and is located within the FSCC. It provides advice on air defense matters, coordinates airspace, and produces the air defense portion of the artillery operations orders. The G2 staff, headed by the division target acquisition battery commander, acting as the Division Artillery Intelligence Officer, or G2 Arty, forms the Artillery Intelligence Cell. It provides representatives to the Division FSCC and the Division Intelligence Collection and Analysis Center, permitting the close integration of artillery and intelligence staffs and a constant interchange of information. This cell is concerned with the location and silencing of enemy guns and multi-barreled rocket launchers with such fire units as are placed at their disposal as well as locating and engaging depth targets. In addition, it maintains the locations of equipment, observation posts, gun positions, and survey data. Produces artillery-oriented intelligence on the enemy. Advises on locating matters and on attacking enemy artillery locations and in-depth targets. And operates the artillery intelligence net.
The G1, G4 staff forms the artillery administration cell. It detaches a representative to the division rear headquarters and provides representation to the division FSCC when required. This cell is responsible for preparation of administrative orders, managing the ammunition supply system, coordinating the maintenance and replacement of equipments, and artillery individual and crewed vehicle replacements. The Division Fire Support Coordination Center is located within the Division Main HQ, employing just under half of the artillery staff. The FSCC provides advice on the use of all fire support resources, and it plans and coordinates fire support and airspace use within the division. The center is headed up by the G3 RT Ops, and he is assisted by representatives from plans, artillery operations, air defense, and by artillery liaison officers. Communications links are provided from the FSCC to all available fire support agencies by the headquarters and signal squadron. Within the FSCC, coordination of the division's airspace takes place under the air defense cell and involves representatives from various division headquarters cells. This function provides for the utilization of the division's airspace in accordance with the commander's priorities and the needs of all users and helps ensure aircraft safety. Division Artillery Alternate HQ is normally provided by the General Support Heavy Regiment and certain key Division Arty HQ staff. The alternate CDA is usually that regiment's commanding officer and may control Division Artillery when the main headquarters is on the move. The General Support Heavy Regiment provides counter-bombardment fire against hostile batteries and in-depth or supporting fire on targets which need a heavier weight of artillery. The fire of this unit is usually controlled at the FSCC and the unit is frequently employed by the DAIO. Zero out. The General Support Heavy Regiment is organized into a headquarters three heavy gun batteries of six guns each, and a headquarters and services battery. The heavy batteries deploy independently as far forward as possible to take advantage of their greater range, usually just to the rear of the close support regiments. They provide limited observation, liaison, and communications in support of their assigned fire missions. The multiple launch rocket regiment also provides general fire support to the division by operating from widely dispersed positions behind the forward brigades from where it can cover the entire division front. The regiment receives its direction to conduct counter battery and depth fire missions from the division FSCC or the DAIO. It is organized into a headquarters, three rocket batteries, each with ten launchers, and a headquarters and services battery. The close support medium regiment establishes FSCCs at brigade and battle group headquarters to provide intimate fire support for the units of a brigade. The regiment also provides surveillance information gained through the network of observation elements and counter-mortar radars to the regiment's intelligence cell located at brigade headquarters. The regiment is organized into a headquarters, four close support medium batteries, each with ten medium self-propelled howitzers, a TA and support battery, and a headquarters and services battery. The regiment's gun batteries deploy at about one-third of the gun's range behind the FIBA, which minimizes the enemy's potential for interference and maximizes the range capability of the guns. The regiment provides the liaison, 
observation and communications elements needed to control the fire of its own and other allotted artillery. The target acquisition battery provides locating and surveillance support to the division. Its main task is to locate enemy guns and launchers so that fire may be brought to bear. Its elements are positioned across the division front and in depth. What we have is a, uh, the battery establishes the artillery intelligence cell at division artillery headquarters and provides ballistic met and artillery survey throughout the division area. It is organized into a headquarters, a remotely piloted vehicle troop, a sound ranging troop, a survey section, a met section, and a services troop. The air defense regiment provides for the low level air defense of the division area. It is organized into a tactical headquarters, a headquarters and services battery, two area and two point defense batteries. Its tasks include general coverage of the division area and the defense of vital points, the passage of early warning information, and establishing an air defense cell as part of the division artillery headquarters. The regiment deploys with the short-range air defense systems providing area and point defense throughout the division area. Artillery command is centralized at the highest workable level and the control of fire is directed from well forward. It is essential to have good communications from observers and locating elements in the forward areas. Through to artillery commanders at battle group, brigade, and division headquarters. Division artillery headquarters relies on close cooperation between its signal squadron and the division headquarters and signals regiment for its communications and administrative support. Its vehicles contain the necessary hardware, processors, and terminals which are linked through the appropriate interface to the area trunk and the combat net radio systems. The technical aspects of fire control lend themselves to computerization and involve the conversion of weapon and ammunition characteristics, non-standard conditions such as muzzle velocities, propellant temperature, projectile weight, and MET information and weapon and target locations into firing data. The results are bearings and elevations for the guns and charge and fuse settings for the shells. Centralized control of artillery fire ensures the best possible concentration of fire. It allocates guns, ammunition, and locating devices to specific tasks places time limits on allocations, and imposes ammunition control measures. Planning for artillery support begins when the operation is conceived and runs parallel to and is coordinated with the formation or unit staff planning activities. The division operation staff allocates the required artillery deployment areas at an early stage to facilitate artillery reconnaissance and survey and to prevent any real estate conflicts. Division artillery incorporates a small administrative element within the DAA, where it provides for the service support needs of the brigade units. Artillery is allotted as direct support, reinforcing, general support reinforcing, and general support. An artillery unit in direct support is immediately responsive to the needs of the supported unit and provides observers, communications, and liaison. The DS artillery commander also coordinates any assigned reinforcing artillery. An artillery unit can be tasked to reinforce another artillery unit to which it provides communication, liaison, and priority of fire support. Given a general support reinforcing task, an artillery unit will support its assigned formation first and the reinforced artillery unit second. 
A general support task means an artillery unit supports the force as a whole, as directed by higher artillery headquarters. When the commander's intent cannot be accurately conveyed by one of the four tasks, these can be modified, limited, or amplified by using non-standard terms. The artillery command and control system provides rapid response to the division's fire support requirements. From forward observers to battery, regimental and division command posts, with coordination by battle group, brigade or division FSCCs, and on to the guns, it allows for the rapid, accurate determination of target data and facilities overall coordination. The system's database enables it to rapidly resolve technical and control problems, coordinating directions to those guns which are about to fire, and assisting the staff to make more rapid and accurate decisions. The lethality of field artillery continues to increase as a result of improved munitions, better accuracy, and increased ranges. The artillery command and control system assists in the application of this ever-increasing weight of firepower and gives the commander the capability of providing quick and accurate fire support. Regiment may be called on short notice to carry out a myriad of tasks involved in the conduct of a United Nations Ready Force, a Defense of Canada, or a CANIS operation. The regiment is organized into five main elements. Included are three rifle commandos, each with three rifle platoons and a support weapon platoon, a headquarters and signal squadron, which provides communications and housekeeping facilities and administers the mortar and pathfinder platoons, and a service commando, providing first-line service support. Depending on the assigned task, the intensity of the expected opposition, general climate and terrain conditions, the regiment may be augmented by elements of the special service force to form an airborne battle group. Just to confirm, quick ray guys at uh, 2400 hours. Dress is winter and follow up kit is required. This is Lieutenant Rokash. Quick rig is on. A quick rig is initiated at W hour by an alert recall. All subsequent timings in the quick rig procedure are based on this key timing. 0745 hours. Okay, bye. Quick rig is the nickname for the procedures through which the Canadian Airborne Regiment is alerted, formed, regrouped, tasked and deployed to conduct an operation within a minimum response time. Port Zilla, let's draw your weapon. Colton Gregor, 62. Security. Make it happen. One second, let's go, let's get the right lane out of the hall. I'm getting to the smart walker. Hold the mess off. The warning order is then issued by the regimental headquarters staff. It initiates the battle procedure necessary to prepare the regiment for the upcoming mission. The warning order also allocates a timing for the regimental commander to issue orders at the departure airfield. The regimental intelligence officer is now uh, collating some insums and input reports and trying to get more detail for you on the end. The airborne regiment, as part of a joint task force, has been assigned a seize and hold mission to secure a forward base in support of subsequent operations to be conducted by a follow-up air landed force. 
The regiment is to be parachuted into the airhead with the air-landed link-up expected to occur early the next day. It is augmented by an airborne artillery battery, an engineer troop, and a medical evacuation platoon. The regiment's objective area is the airfield and the associated complex of hangars, communications, maintenance, and administrative buildings. A joint task force headquarters element has been established at the departure airfield. It concentrates on the overall administrative and logistics problems involving the administration, mounting and resupply of the airborne and air-landed forces, and provides detailed support to the regiment's mounting activities. A liaison officer from the regiment has been established at the Joint Task Force Headquarters. His main functions are to advise the commander on the decision to launch the operation and to assist with its coordination. The coordination of mounting activities is essential to timely and efficient deployment. To this end, a regimental organization is formed consisting of a preparation and a mounting element. The preparation element, commanded by the CO of Service Commando, operates from the home base. It stages the regiment from the garrison location to the departure airfield. The main components of the preparation element include a logistics operations center, which coordinates preparation and staging activities, the repair or replacement of all essential equipment, and the receipt of ammunition, stores, and equipment required for the operation. A packing team, which issues rigging materials and combat supplies to units, operates a pre-rigging area, supervises, inspects, and accepts loads, and directs their onward transmission to the departure airfield. And a number of range teams, which check and zero the regiment's small arms and direct fire weapons, and conduct a technical inspection on the mortars and guns. The mounting element operates from the departure airfield under command of the regimental administrative officer. It stages the regiment through the departure airfield. The main components of the mounting element include a forward headquarters which coordinates the mounting support for the regiment. It provides briefings and documentation to the airlift force and supervises the preparation of unit equipment for aerial delivery. An emplaning team, which assists with the documentation, preparation, and loading of personnel aboard aircraft. The service support group, which coordinates transport, messing, accommodation, maintenance, and general stores needs. And unit advance parties, which coordinate the receiving of equipment, assist with rigging loads, and help prepare aircraft loading tables. Departure assistance groups are provided from the supporting base and the Canadian Airborne Regiment to process personnel and equipment for operational deployment. The personnel group checks the medical, administrative, and spiritual fitness of each member of the battle group and updates documents and records. The equipment group ensures that unserviceable equipment is either repaired or replaced that unit holdings of stores and supplies are replenished as required, and that vehicles and cargo are ready for the move to the departure airfield. Paralleling the mounting and administrative activity is the ongoing battle procedure which prepares the airborne force for its pending mission. Okay. There's a later end update. Okay, can you just show me where they are on the... Uh, Intelligence model? updates are distributed and the regimental commander prepares his detailed estimate, plan, and preliminary orders. We have a mission, uh, and what I would like to do now is get the warning order out uh, to the battle group as quickly as possible. The main body departs the garrison location and moves to the departure airfield. On arrival, the main body is met by representatives of the mounting element advance parties.
personnel are allotted transient accommodations and ration facilities and continue battle procedure for the operation. In the meantime, the transport aircraft are beginning to concentrate at the departure airfield, where they are converted for parachute operations. This involves the changing of fittings, fixing seats, positioning hookups for anchor lines, and installing roller systems to handle the heavy loads. Details regarding the aircraft conversions, timings, sequencing and control of personnel and equipment to be dropped or air landed, and aircraft arrangements are coordinated by the air transport and airborne regiment liaison officers. These are laid down in the air movement and aircraft loading tables. Imperative in the preparation of these tables is the concept of tactical cross-loading in support of the ground tactical plan. This involves the loading of key individuals, subunits, and equipment on specific aircraft, ensuring that all elements arrive on the same drop zone at roughly the same time, and minimizes the effects of the loss of any one aircraft through mechanical malfunction or enemy action. And the last aircraft is to include the Once all the operational the details have been coordinated, the, the regimental commander issues his orders. Enemy as possible. Thank you very much. At the departure airfield, an airlift control center is established, which incorporates a control element for planning, coordinating, and tasking of airlift activities and a number of MAMS teams to load and rig cargo. A movement control center is set up close to the ALCE and coordinates the flow of vehicles, equipment, and personnel to the airfield. Loads accompanying personnel on the main drop are placed on board the aircraft and hooked up by the MAMS teams prior to the emplaning of the troops. When ready, they are turned over to the aircraft loadmaster, who is responsible for the preparation and rigging of the aircraft prior to takeoff. Loadmasters also provide the communications link between the aircraft commander and parachutists to coordinate dispatch procedures during the mission. The ground tactical plan requires the use of two drop zones. The main DZ was selected to provide immediate access to the terminal buildings, powerhouse, and fuel storage site, and thereby defeat any attempt at their demolition. It includes an area which can handle the guns, ammunition, and other heavy loads. An alternate DZ has also been selected which is of an adequate size to handle the entire drop should the main DZ become unusable. A pathfinder group has been assigned to each DZ and inserted outside the objective area, 24 to 48 hours in advance of the main assault force. After landing, each group moves to their respective DZ area and establishes a patrol base. From there, they recce the surrounding dominating terrain, the routes to the various objectives, and the DZ surface confirming its suitability, and advise the force commander of any hazards along the aircraft approach route. Troops arrive at the regimental emplaning point in chalk groupings and strap on their parachutes and personal equipment. Once dressing is completed, they are inspected by their jump master. The final air crew coordination is completed by the pilot and the JM briefs his chalk on the technical parameters of the jump and on any specific safety considerations. Once ready and on order of regimental headquarters, personnel board their respective aircraft and manifests are collected by the implaning staff. Try and work out at least three drop zones per purse Meteorological forecasts for the period are favorable and the time to begin the drop, or PR, is scheduled for 1200 on the 22nd. This will permit the quick securing of objectives and a reorganization by daylight, followed by a period of darkness where any enemy moving against the force will be at a disadvantage. 
The link-up with the air-landed force is planned for first light. The timings will also assist with the suppression of enemy air defense fire and facilitate close air support and air superiority missions. The airborne regiment, including its load of equipment, ammunition and stores, requires approximately 36 C-130 chocks. The first lift will include all essential assault elements, with subsequent lifts delivering sustaining elements, stores, and any equipment needed for the duration of the operation. The balance of attached engineer and A echelon personnel and equipment will be airdropped or landed as part of the link-up phase following the securing of the airhead. Minutes before P hour, the DZ is marked. The DZ controller takes charge of the drop. The guides move to the DZ RVs in anticipation of the arrival of the assault, and the FUs and MFCs direct close air support aircraft and any in-range artillery against pre-planned and opportunity targets. On approaching the chosen DZ, the assault force formation flies as close to the ground as possible to mask aircraft from enemy radar and air defense fire. At the last minute, they pop up to jump altitude and slow down to their drop speed. The loads are then dispatched from the aircraft ramps, followed by the paratroopers through the side doors. The aircraft immediately drop down to their ground masking altitude for the return trip. On landing, the assault elements recover accompanying equipment and head to their designated RVs. At the RV, a waiting guide meets up with and quickly briefs the commando on its objective and the route to it, and they depart the RV to carry out their assault tasks. The regimental commander's tactical headquarters is deployed well forward commanding a view of the initial objectives. Here, he confirms the tactical plan and provides the required direction to the operation. The rifle commandos are equipped with small arms, light automatic weapons, and short-range anti-armor weapons to deal with hardened point targets and lightly armored vehicles. They man-pack their ammunition and equipment. Each commando may include vehicles for communications, direct fire weapons, and ammunition resupply. The assault continues until the commandos have achieved their initial objectives and the airhead is secured. The regimental headquarters is initially established adjacent to the DZ. It deploys as a command post with its integral operations and intelligence sections. Co-located with the HQ is the Fire Support Coordination Center, which is based on the headquarters elements of the mortar platoon and the supporting artillery battery. The recce platoon operates from the RHQ location, providing patrols and establishing OPs to give warning of approaching enemy forces. The signal squadron locates near the command post. It mans the regimental command net, the headquarters internal communications, and the rear link back to the joint task force headquarters. A military police section assists with protection of the headquarters complex, any local traffic control requirements, and the handling of PWs. Other elements are operational within minutes of landing. The airborne battery deploys an FSCC element, four observer parties, and 12 105 mm guns. The gun position is initially located near the heavy lift DZ. 24 rounds of ammunition are stacked on each gun platform. 
and additional ammunition is normally dropped adjacent to their firing positions. The battery can also jump with mortars in lieu of the L5 gun. The mortar platoon, with its six firing detachments, can operate from a central location or from two dispersed sites. A minimum of 100 rounds accompanies each mortar on the initial drop. The guns and mortars bring down fire on targets designated by the FUs and MFCs attached to the commandos and the recce detachments. The service commando deploys as an A echelon group at the airhead with its integral supply, transport, and maintenance assets. It recovers stores from the DZ, breaks bulk ammunition into issue groups for each commando, arranges for the forward delivery of sustaining stores and follow-up kits, and assists with the security of the airhead. The bulk of the airborne engineer troop would normally accompany the assault element. They gather their stores and equipment and begin work on their task of opening a landing strip. They search for mines, fill in craters, clear snow, and remove rubble. Once serviceable, the runway area is turned over to an accompanying tactical air movement section, which organizes it to receive the oncoming air landed force. In the meantime, a low altitude parachute extraction zone has been established by the TAMs adjacent to the airfield. It is used to continue the buildup of stores and equipment. Medical support to the force is initially provided at casualty collecting points by medical assistants attached to the commandos. They provide immediate aid to the wounded and help move them to the unit medical station. Casualties are moved rearward from the CCPs to the UMS, which is located in the A echelon area. It functions under the direction of the regimental surgeon, who prioritizes treatment and provides life-sustaining care. The airborne evacuation platoon is located at the airhead, where it evacuates patients from the UMS, assists with the provision of medical care, the operation of a limited casualty holding facility, the preparation of patients for evacuation, and their staging back to the mounting base. Casualties are evacuated from the airhead in returning aircraft or by aeromedical evacuation flights. Emergency sustaining care on a medevac flight is provided by a medical escort team of nurses and medical assistants. After arriving back at the mounting base, casualties are moved to a forward casualty staging station where they are processed and directed to the appropriate medical facility. Once the objectives have been secured, each commando consolidates their assigned defense sector. The regimental HQ relocates to where it can best direct the fight against any enemy attempting to recapture the airfield. The guns and mortars redeploy to more centralized firing positions. The recce elements depart on their reconnaissance tasks. And the anti-armor detachments take up positions covering the main approaches. At first light, the first of the air-landed chalks arrive with the balance of the regiment's personnel and equipment, and the initial elements of the follow-up force. The troops deplane and equipment is unloaded to join the developing airhead. The engineers complete any further improvements to the airstrip and carry out other conventional engineer tasks. Prisoners taken during the operation are held in an airhead PW collecting point where they are interrogated by the airborne force intelligence staff. PWs are normally evacuated by air as soon as possible after capture.
one half miles from touchdown. Heading is good. Descent is excellent. On the glide path. Range one mile from touchdown. Final wind check one at six zero at five knots. Clear the full stop. Crew radar control emits five eighths of a mile. Advisory only. On course. On glide path. On course. On glide path. One quarter mile from touchdown. On course, on glide path, over touchdown now. Carriage a full stop, radar standing by. The Air Transportable Communication and Control Unit is established under Air Transport Group, providing air transportable navigation aids, tactical communications, landing aid facilities, and air traffic control in support of worldwide air command operations, joint Army Air Force operations, disasters and emergencies, and as an emergency backup to existing airfield facilities. The requirement for support is tasked through Air Transport Group headquarters to the ATCCU, which deploys varying elements of the unit depending on the requirements of each operation. Personnel augmentation may be required from outside sources. The unit can provide a complete self-contained communications and control package to enable the upgrading of an existing airstrip to instrument flight rule standards. The complete system is deployable on six hours notice by C-130 aircraft. The facilities provided by the system include local communications for use by the operations staff, a secure long-haul link to assist the commander with operations, air traffic control services in the airspace approaching and surrounding the airhead terminal area, air navigation aids operating in the terminal area, an instrument approach capability for operations in poor visibility, and various airfield support facilities assisting transport and fighter aircraft operations. The unit also extends coverage of the military aeronautical communication system by providing air ground air communications along with a phone patch facility, aviation weather broadcasts, terminal forecasts, and flight safety information. Should high-capacity, long-haul communications be required that are beyond the capability of the ATCCU, a long-range communications terminal may be provided from national resources. A unit team leader reporting to the deployment commander is responsible for the proper operation of the deployed system, liaison with the operations staff and other agencies, and coordinating the administrative and logistic support needs of the team. The unit can provide an operational communications and control capability within approximately six hours after its arrival, with an additional six hours needed to complete the setup of the lighting kit and the arrestor gear. It may take up to 24 hours to finalize all checks on the system's radar, navigation, and communications equipment. The unit's air transportable facilities include control towers, air traffic control radars, tactical air navigation aids, non-directional beacons, airfield lighting kits, operations shelters, medium-range communications terminals, portable satellite ground terminals, and mobile arrestor gear. In addition, the unit provides various UHF, VHF, HF radio and telephone communications equipments. It also incorporates crane-equipped trucks to help with the assembly of the quad radar, logistics vehicles for resupply and local transport, and auxiliary generator units to provide on-site power when a commercial source is not available. The control tower provides for the local control of air traffic in the airspace surrounding the airfield. It incorporates a main console for use by the air traffic control officer who uses a grouping of air ground air radios and the required meteorological instrumentation to provide direction and weather information to aircraft. 
The controller's assistant provides ground control to local vehicles operating on the airfield. The radar unit assists with the en route and local control of air traffic and is used as a landing aid to enable aircraft to make safe approaches and landings in marginal weather conditions. The unit is a self-contained entity with the equipment required to transmit and receive radar and communications information. As well, it incorporates living facilities for the duty shift. The quad radar features a 360 degree area of surveillance to a range of 40 nautical miles, a height finder capability, a precision approach presentation to the runway in use, and a low power taxi display. The secondary surveillance radar provides bearing, distance, altitude readout, and identification of any aircraft within its working range of 200 miles. The TACAN equipment provides automatic bearing, identification, and distance information to aircraft out to a distance of 100 miles. It incorporates a remote alarm system in case of component failure and is powered by a portable generator. The non-directional beacon can be backpacked into location and set up by one man. It transmits a Morse code homing signal to aircraft as far out as 25 nautical miles. It operates from batteries or it can use a small generator. The airfield lighting kit provides variable intensity lighting for the approach ends and one main runway as well as for the associated taxiways and ramp area. The kit includes all the lights, cables and transformers needed to support a 10,000 foot runway. The specially equipped shelters are for use in austere locations by the operations staff, air movements and servicing personnel. The shelters can be configured to incorporate telephones, a secure lockup for documents, various types of radios, and communications for local control of vehicles and personnel. The medium range communications terminal can be used in conjunction with the deployed operations center. It provides the deployment commander with a secure teletype link to the automated defense data network using either HF radio communications, telephone, or data lines. The teletype circuit may be remoted into the operations center. The portable satellite ground terminal provides voice or data communications to an earth station and then via the commercial system to any destination. It can be used on its own or in conjunction with an MRCT or secure telephone circuit and is operated by one person. The mobile arrestor gear is comprised of two extender units anchored on either side of the runway with an arrestor cable running between them. The equipment can be reset in three minutes. The navigation, tactical communications, and landing aid facilities, coupled with the air traffic control services provided by the ATCCU, are readily available for the support of deployed air resources wherever they may be required.
The role of the Brigade Headquarters and Signal Squadron is to provide the commander and his staff with the command, control and information systems required to fight the battle throughout the Brigade area. It also provides for the administration and local defense of Brigade Headquarters. The squadron deploys into Brigade Main and Alternate Headquarters, which are supported by A1 and A2 echelon elements. The Brigade Main Headquarters encompasses most of the staff and the bulk of the squadron's signal resources. It includes the command group with the Brigade Commander and his selected staff and advisors. The operations group with the Brigade Operations Center, its support and clerical substaffs and attached elements including support arms representatives, liaison officers and a section from the military police platoon. The signals group comprising the squadron headquarters, the access and radio troops and the main defense and security platoon which provides protection for the operations center and for the commander. And an A1 echelon element which looks after the immediate needs of the headquarters. The brigade alternate headquarters mirrors the structure of the main headquarters group, but on a considerably reduced scale. The commander may operate from his main or alternate headquarters, or he may function from his tactical command post. The TAC-CP comprises command, communications, and liaison vehicles, a selected group of staff and advisors, and a protection party. It enables the commander to exercise personal command over a critical part of the battle at the desired location. The operations center is the hub of the headquarters. It is headed by the G3, who coordinates the execution of all operations, intelligence and liaison functions. He, in conjunction with the brigade signal officer, also controls the deployment and movement of both the main and alternate headquarters. Adjacent to the operations center is the G4, who is assisted by a small administrative staff. He coordinates all administrative staff activity in support of ongoing and future operations. The G4 also receives queries and advice from service and specialist staff advisors who are normally located in the brigade administrative area. The arms advisors may also establish staff elements at brigade main headquarters which advise and support the overall effort and either direct or provide liaison to their own units. They establish the Fire Support Coordination Center, the Air Defense and Artillery Intelligence Cells, the Tactical Air Control Party, and the Engineer, Aviation, and Electronic Warfare Liaison Teams. The commanding officer of the squadron is also the Brigade Signal Officer. As such, he is responsible to plan and coordinate the overall Brigade Signal effort, to control signal stores, and to assign priorities for the maintenance of signal equipment. As CO of the squadron, he is responsible for the command of the unit and its isolated elements, for the execution of signals operations, and for the administration and defense of the brigade headquarters. The squadron headquarters includes a planning office which looks after forward planning for future operations, and the signal command post which oversees the minute-to-minute -minute status of the squadron's radio, line, and radio relay circuits. It also encompasses a field mobile distributing authority, which holds and issues codes and ciphers for the brigade. A cryptographic stores detachment, which handles the specialist cryptographic needs of the squadron. And a monitor detachment, which reports on signal security violations and interference problems. Access Troop provides telephone, teletype, facsimile and data communications for the headquarters and access to the area trunk system. The troop incorporates a control office which monitors the functioning of the troop's communications. An access node which incorporates a message center with secure teletype and facsimile service, radio relay terminals and repeaters, automatic voice and data switches, and an offline crypto capability. A line section which lays and maintains the required line communications down to regiment, battalion, and independent squadron level. They are also responsible for local lines within the headquarters, remotes to the radio park, and tails from radio relay terminals. A dispatch rider section, which operates the signal dispatch service for the brigade, along with special and air dispatch services. 
operators to handle data inputs for the automated combat information system, and a distributing authority which looks after the troops' crypto account. The radio troop provides combat net radio communications for the brigade voice and data, command, administrative and guard nets. The troop provides a headquarters control element which plans, tasks, controls and monitors the minute-to-minute -minute operation of the brigade radio nets. The vehicles which are used by the brigade headquarters staff in the main headquarters location. The brigade commander's tactical command post the rovers used by brigade staff and liaison officers, the radio rebroadcast detachments used to extend the range of a given net, and the brigade's main and rear link radio detachments. The greater part of its personnel and equipment are located in a nearby radio park, and the radios are remoted into the various command and staff vehicles of the headquarters. The squadron A2 echelon is located from 5 to 10 kilometers to the rear of the main headquarters. It contains the bulk of the squadron's administrative resources, mainly comprising the squadron's refueling, stores and repair parts vehicles, a kitchen, the unit medical station, and mobile repair teams, which provide recovery and repair to the squadron's vehicles, trailers, generators, and weapons. It also includes a telecommunications maintenance section with MRTs for the repair of radio, terminal, and cipher equipment. Also located with the A2 echelon are any radio and radio relay detachments not required at the main or alternate headquarters locations. The brigade main and alternate headquarters are located where they can control subordinate units and still communicate with higher and flanking formations. Locations are selected where the terrain allows communications in the desired directions and on ground that is high enough for good reception. A site should be readily accessible by wheeled vehicles from the brigade's main axis and include a nearby cleared area for use as a landing zone. There must be adequate space for dispersion and a degree of concealment from air observation. A site should require minimal signal or engineer preparation prior to its occupation. It should be defensible against ground attack and, where possible, gain a degree of protection from a nearby unit. In considering the layout of the headquarters, the operation center must be at the core of the headquarters complex, where it is guarded by a picket and protected by other headquarters elements. The command group is located in a quiet area adjacent to the operation center. The signal's command post is sited close to both the operation center and the communications elements. The access node area is near the vehicle park, with the message center readily accessible to DRs, LOs, and visitors. The information post and car park are near the entrance. Administrative facilities are positioned to provide easy access and to complement the defensive posture of the HQ. Rest areas should be away from centers of activity. And the radio park may be sited up to 10 kilometers from the headquarters. In operations, combat net radio is the primary means of communication within the brigade. Its use will vary with the type of operation and the inherent danger it poses in revealing the location of the headquarters. Remote sighting of the radio park improves the security of the headquarters by reducing its radiation signature. It also allows the headquarters to be located in a protected site that is not necessarily good for communications. The area trunk communication system is almost totally reliant on radio relay, which favors the use of high ground. Terrain masking, together with the use of repeaters and elevated sites, will help guard against their early detection and engagement by the enemy. In consideration of the continuing requirement to move the headquarters, the G3 and the signal staff selected several probable locations, which were subsequently checked out, and their suitability was recorded for later use. Just prior to a move, the G3 authorizes the dispatch of the headquarters recce party to one of the pre-selected locations. It conducts a sweep of the area lays out the site in accordance with the standard pattern and the requirements of that particular piece of ground, signs the location, and then calls in the advance party, which has been waiting nearby. 
When the advance party arrives, it starts preparing the site, lays out defenses, establishes communications, locates a landing zone, signs the traffic circuits, and starts laying the required lines. At a given time, control is transferred from Brigade Main to alternate headquarters. The main headquarters then packs up and moves to its new location, where it joins up with its advance elements. Throughout the move and during the setup period, the headquarters remains on radio silence, with the staff monitoring operations to remain abreast of the situation. A small rear party is left behind to redirect visitors and to relay traps. The alternate headquarters continues to run the operation until control is returned to the main HQ. It then goes back on listening watch and moves to a new location. The headquarters and signal squadron provides the brigade commander and his staff with the communications required for the ongoing battle. It also defends, administers, and moves the brigade headquarters in accordance with its operational needs. Signals is a member of and contributor to the all arms team on the battlefield. armor concept in the defense is to defeat massed armor or mechanized infantry formations by employing a family of weapons with overlapping ranges. The objective is to destroy many enemy armor vehicles to weaken his leading echelons to such an extent that they will be unable to achieve a major breakthrough. In the delaying phase of battle, the enemy will first be engaged in the covering force area by any available close support aircraft, rocket and tube artillery, and attack helicopters. 
The covering force would incorporate long-range fire units, principally tanks and heavy armor weapons, to destroy enemy reconnaissance elements, force early deployment, and identify the direction of his main thrust. During the battle for the main defense area, the enemy will be kept under continuous direct fire from a coordinated framework of anti-armor weapons firing from maximum ranges. As the enemy closes up and enters pre-selected killing zones, he will be engaged from the flanks by tanks, heavy anti-armor weapons, and attack helicopters. Tank destroyers and medium-range weapons will join in as the enemy runs up against our main defensive locations. When he is at close range, he will be engaged by every available weapon. Tanks will only be superimposed on the framework of the anti-armor plan, as they will be heavily tasked for counterattack and blocking operations. When undertaking any counter moves, anti-armor weapons aid the maneuver force when employed on flank protection to cover the movement of the maneuver force to support reorganization beyond the objective to provide an anti-armor reserve to assist in securing the line of departure and attack routes and to assist with rear guard protection and in the picketing of enemy positions. Due to the unavailability of tank destroyer film, they will be visually represented by the M109. We are also required to represent the medium anti-armor weapon system with the unarmored and man-pack tow systems. Anti-armor resources available within the division include the Division Anti-Armor Battalion, the Brigade Anti-Armor Squadrons, the Tactical Aviation Wing Attack Squadron, the Tank Regiments, and the Infantry Battalion Anti-Armor Platoon. The latter are dealt with in separate videos, which should be viewed in concert with this production. The Division Anti-Armor Battalion comprises a headquarters with a small signals element, three anti-armor companies, and an administration company. Each anti-armor company has two platoons, with a total of 16 tow under armor weapon systems, and an administrative platoon providing A echelon support for the company's widely dispersed detachments. The division commander will likely allot one company under command of each brigade, and the brigades in turn may place one platoon under command of each mechanized infantry battalion. The battalion commander is normally located at division headquarters, with company commanders at their assigned brigade headquarters. Yes, sir. There, they provide anti-armor advice to their commanders and help coordinate division and brigade anti-armor operations. The anti-armor platoon's eight long-range heavy anti-armor weapons detachments are grouped into sections of two The platoon commander is responsible for sighting his detachments, for controlling their maneuver, and for coordinating their fire with the infantry battalion medium anti-armor weapons. The platoon carries a reserve of ammunition, fuel, and equipment for checking out the launchers. It would include an attached ambulance to facilitate operations from forward locations. The platoon depends upon its assigned mechanized infantry battalion for the bulk of its combat service support. The anti-armor companies are organized and equipped so that they can be readily detached to the brigades 
to reinforce the anti-armor framework covering critical enemy approaches through the main defense area. Their weapons would initially be sighted well forward in sniping positions to engage enemy armor at maximum range. As the enemy advances, they would gradually withdraw to defilade positions in the main defense area. The battalion's administrative company is lightly structured in accordance with the detached nature of its subunits. Its A2 echelon concentrates mainly on forward repair, ammunition resupply, and casualty evacuation, while the battalion's B echelon is located in the division administrative area. The brigade anti-armor squadron comprises four tank destroyer troops each with four tank destroyers and a support services troop. Its headquarters would be located well forward with a view of the main killing zone. It includes a tank destroyer and an APC dozer to assist with digging in. A liaison detachment would be located at brigade headquarters. The squadron support services troop includes the vehicles and personnel to provide the dispersed elements in the forward area replenishment, first line maintenance, and casualty evacuation. The squadron's primary tasks involve reinforcement of the anti-armor framework in the main defense area and the covering of gaps between forward formations and battle groups. Three of its troops would likely be under command of battle groups and deployed well forward, providing intimate direct fire support to combat teams and battle groups. The fourth troop would normally be employed as a reserve or on flank protection. Tank destroyers will normally be employed in pairs and co-located with combat team or battalion anti-armor platoon elements where the use of obstacles, local security, and digging would minimize their vulnerabilities. At any point in the battle, tank destroyers may be repositioned as required to counter a specific enemy threat. The basic weaponry dedicated to anti-armor operations includes main battle tanks, tank destroyers, attack helicopters, heavy, medium, and personal anti-tank weapons, anti-APC cannons, scatterable mines, and obstacle systems. These will all be augmented to a degree by close air support missions, along with gun and missile artillery. The tank is the best assault anti-tank weapon, and usually leads the attacking force. Tanks also supplement other long-range anti-armor weapons in the static direct fire role. The tank gun system with its advanced optics provides a good night capability. The tank's fighting range extends out to 2,000 meters and its ammunition is capable of defeating all known types of enemy armor. Tank destroyers are designed to be employed in a defensive role augmenting anti-armor missile systems and freeing up tanks for employment elsewhere. They are compact, well-armored, and incorporate a simple gun system, which can rapidly engage a succession of targets within a limited arc out to its best fighting range of 2,000 meters. Attack helicopters employ a guided missile weapon system. They can effectively engage targets from pre-selected firing positions out to maximum standoff range of approximately 8,000 meters. As a consequence of their inherent limitations of weather, serviceability, and visibility conditions, they are superimposed on rather than embedded in the anti-armor framework of the division. The heavy anti-armor weapon utilizes a tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided, heavy anti-tank missile with a thermal imaging sight. The system is effective against stationary and moving armored targets, and its best fighting ranges are from 500 to just under 4,000 meters. 
Each detachment includes a separate man pack anti-armor weapon to compensate for operations in difficult terrain. The main anti-armor weapon is similar to the Haw, but is lighter and easier to move about. It operates with a two-man crew and incorporates a semi-automatic guidance system with an infrared night sight that only requires the operator to keep the crosshairs on the target. Its best fighting ranges are from 500 to 2,000 meters. Short-range self-defense anti-armor weapons are widely distributed to all elements of the division. The heavy weapon has a fighting range out to 600 meters, while the light weapon is best handled out to 100 meters. These can be easily carried in dismounted operations and are most useful with tank hunting teams in built-up areas. The infantry combat vehicle incorporates an anti-armor cannon capable of defeating armored personnel carriers and other lightly armored vehicles. Its best fighting range is up to 3,000 meters. Obstacles such as conventional minefields and anti-tank ditches force the enemy to present an increased number of targets under more favorable engagement conditions to our main anti-armor weapon systems. Scatterable anti-tank and anti-personnel mines can be employed to thicken up existing obstacles and to quickly block an approach, thus slowing down an enemy advance. They may also trap enemy columns and elements, rendering them ineffective. The firepower and mobility of aircraft employed in a close air support role make an immediate and direct contribution to the land battle. Their rockets, bombs, and cannons are effective against all types of armor. Artillery will continue to function in its traditional role of providing indirect fire support and in separating enemy APCs from their tanks. It also forces tanks to button up, making them considerably less effective. In addition, indirect fire can obscure terrain with smoke to confuse the enemy. Degrade the enemy gunner's aiming ability and damage his sighting systems. Destroy tanks and APCs by top attack and guided munitions. And deliver mines to channelize and assist in the destruction of the enemy. The anti-armor aspect of planning is an overriding consideration in the development of the overall division defense plan. Generally, the division commander's concept and plan flows downwards to brigades and to their battle groups. The foundation of the anti-armor plan is built up by the battle groups with coordination being effected back up through brigades to the division. The brigade commander's anti-armor plan will become the framework of his defense. But due to the complexity of the battlefield, he will have to further delegate and assign anti-armor resources down to the battle groups. Anti-armor plans must be coordinated with other plans, and especially with the fire plan, which must allow for the close protection and redeployment of tank destroyers and heavy anti-armor detachments. The barrier plan, which channels the enemy into killing zones, which must be covered by anti-armor weapons. The surveillance and target acquisition plan to provide assistance in identification and tracking of targets for the long-range weapons. And the counter-move, counter-attack plan, which will allocate anti-armor resources in support of maneuver forces. The division commander's estimate projects areas where enemy armor could be expected. He allocates his anti-armor resources to meet this threat, mainly based on what enemy strength can be expected on each armored approach. What ground features dominate these approaches?
and what weapon systems or grouping should be employed on which ground features to gain the maximum killing effect. To counter the threat, resources which could be made available to a battle group include a platoon from the Division Anti-Armor Battalion and a troop from the Brigade Anti-Armor Squadron. These resources would be deployed in conjunction with detachments from the Battalion Anti-Armor Platoon and the integral capability of the rifle companies. In addition, the battalion may be allocated a squadron from the tank regiment, close air support missions, artillery launched anti-armor missiles, and scatterable mines. One of the battalion selected killing zones may also be designated to receive attack helicopter support. Within the context of the anti-armor defense, certain fundamentals apply at every organizational level. These involve depth, mutual support, security, concentration, and weapons integration. Enemy frontal and flanking approaches must be covered in depth throughout the defensive sector. This involves main positions to contain concentrated enemy attacks, unlikely approaches, and alternate positions to provide for concentration of additional forces to contain a determined thrust. Anti-armor plans must ensure an attack on any one position can be engaged by one or more adjacent elements. This involves the sighting and dispersion of battle positions, the coordination of interlocking arcs of fire, and the assignment of combat teams to battle positions in response to an enemy thrust. The front, flanks, and rear of a battle position must be covered by unit anti-armor weapons to defeat an attack from any direction. Rear area elements must be prepared to defend their perimeters against enemy armor. At a minimum, sufficient numbers of weapons must be assigned to bring the enemy's thrust to a standstill. This involves the rapid gathering of forces from less threatened areas, concentrating them around the enemy, achieving a mass killing quickly, and then dispersing or moving on to another operation. All weapons capable of destroying armor are integral to the anti-armor defense. Each must be well concealed with clear fields of fire employed at its effective fighting range and not necessarily sighted within assigned combat team battle positions. An elementary problem arises in planning the defense. Which to sight first, the anti-armor weapons or the rifle companies? Anti-armor weapons must be sighted to overlook likely enemy mounted approaches and selected killing zones. Some of the long range weapons will likely be deployed outside the defense perimeter. Rifle companies are located to block enemy dismounted attacks, which are attempting to destroy our anti-armor weapons. In addition, company positions containing anti-armor weapons may be larger than desired to allow maneuver room and avoid neutralization of the entire position once anti-armor fire commences. The key is to cite anti-armor weapons to dominate the enemy over his mounted approaches and force him to dismount. The rifle companies are then deployed to defeat the enemy on the dismounted approaches to the position. The brigade commander's estimate has identified the major and secondary enemy mechanized approaches that lead to the brigade vital ground. The battle group commander has estimated he must commence attrition on the major approach in a forward kill zone on the far side of the obstacle. 
he has further identified two other kill zones within his assigned defense area. He plans to deploy the eight assigned long-range anti-armor weapons in standoff positions to first cover the limits of the forward kill zone and then to cover the close-in kill zones on the home side of the FIBA. He then positions the battalion medium range anti-armor weapons to cover the various kill zones. And the tank destroyers are similarly integrated into the anti-armor framework. The company's medium range anti-armor weapons and the anti-ABC cannons will normally be deployed in the battle positions. The tank squadrons assigned to the battle group are to be initially positioned well forward on sniping tasks and then held back as a reserve for counterattack or blocking actions. They have been superimposed on the overall anti-armor framework so that they can be withdrawn if required elsewhere. The proliferation of anti-armor resources has created command and control problems of considerable complexity. Resources must be correctly sighted, well coordinated, and then employment must be tightly controlled if their combined shock effect is to be fully exploited. The anti-armor battle and the defensive battle are one in the same and must be regarded as such. Anti-armor weapons are a vital part of the flexible defensive framework and must be capable of being repositioned as the battle develops. Success in the anti-armor battle will be based on the skilled handling of the division anti-armor weapon systems and the manipulation of the defensive framework. The Joint Air Attack Team is a combination of helicopters from the Division Attack Squadron and aircraft from an Air Force Fighter Squadron assigned in support of a formation's battle plan. They operate together to attack tanks and other massed targets on the same part of the battlefield. During offensive operations, the team can be best employed against attacking enemy forces that are in the open prior to their being engaged by direct fire of land units. While in the defense, it is most often used to reinforce a unit engaged in containing an enemy armored thrust. The team normally operates in conjunction with brigade or battle group sized maneuver elements and is supported by their artillery and direct fire anti-armor weapons. The attack helicopter liaison officer coordinates the employment of his squadron with the appropriate maneuver element. He also helps plan for the expected arrival of close air support aircraft and their incorporation into the overall battle plan. The attack helicopter flight is the smallest element of the squadron deployed as a combat entity. Its helicopters are usually armed with eight tow missiles, two pods of armor-piercing rockets, and an anti-armor cannon. The flight is normally accompanied by a section of observation helicopters. Observation helicopters assist the operation by recceing the target area for battle and firing positions, avenues of approach, choke points, and potential killing zones. They can also search out and report on potential enemy tanks, air defense weapons, and other large hard targets.
maintain visual contact with the advancing enemy elements, and direct any available fire support. They also pass on information to any ground-based or airborne forward air controllers who may be in a position to directly control the incoming fighters and are available to help the aviation commander coordinate the operation. As aviation activity begins, the attack helicopters move to pre-selected holding areas from which they can deploy to engage the enemy. Meanwhile, back at the main operations base, the close air support aircraft have been placed on the appropriate alert status, mission briefings have been completed, and the pilots have finalized their pre-attack coordination. Typical of the specialist close air support aircraft is the A-10, which is primarily designed to engage enemy armored targets. It includes an internally mounted 30 millimeter anti-armor cannon and incorporates 11 weapon stations which can carry approximately 8 tons of ordnance. The A-10's capability is enhanced by a passive laser detection system which assists in locating and identifying targets. Its infrared and optically guided missiles permit a standoff attack against enemy tanks and other vehicles. The flight normally employs a two-ship line, wedge or trail formation, which provides optimum control, especially in the poor visibility conditions to be expected over the battlefield, and which permits each pilot to aggressively maneuver his aircraft and search for targets. At a designated time, the fighters establish communications with the FAC as they near the contact point. The FAC briefs the pilots on the target, the air defense threat, relative positions of friendly forces to the target, any ongoing activity of attack helicopters, the heading and distance to the initial point, and recommends a direction for the attack. They travel via a route and altitude to stay below enemy radar and surface-to-air missile coverage and employ terrain masking techniques to avoid detection. The flight then departs for the initial point. While en route, they establish communications with the attack helicopter flight and receive updated threat and target information. On arrival, they are given their final attack clearance by the FAC. The flight leader determines the attack profile and tactics to be employed. Generally, near simultaneous sector or sequential attacks coordinated by timing criteria or geographic features from different approaches afford the highest probability of surprise and saturation of localized enemy air defense weapons. The sector attack divides the target area into distinct blocks, each with specific targets and one or more approaches. This option simplifies coordination, assists with the provision of mutual support, reduces ordnance interference problems, and eases the operation during periods of extreme communications jamming. The sequential attack is used when the target area is small and its approaches are limited. It is designed to keep continuous pressure on the enemy with one element engaging while the other is maneuvering to a new firing position. During the battle, each component of the team, along with supporting artillery and ground maneuver forces, attempt to maintain a continuous application of fire on the target area and provide each other with updated target and air defense information. Division artillery would initially have attempted to slow the enemy attack, damage air defense radars, and cause armored vehicles to button up. Once the air battle is joined, the fire is continued to minimize the effectiveness of enemy armor and their air defense weapon systems. Throughout the engagement, the helicopter flight leader shifts supporting artillery fire in relation to the needs of the attacking aircraft, integrates the firepower of his helicopters with the incoming close air support aircraft, coordinates his attacks with the FAC and the ground maneuver commander, 
and uses helicopter firepower to suppress any local enemy air defense weapons immediately prior to the arrival of the fighters and on their departure. He may also assume direct control of the attack should the FAC lose his communications. The engagement continues until it is called off by the flight leader or the FAC or until ordnance is expended. The fighters depart the area at low altitude, maintaining mutual support and using terrain masking to minimize exposure. The Joint Air Attack Team is a potent weapons combination which can strike quickly and decisively at a threatened point. The coordinated effort of attack helicopter units and ground forces, supported by close air support aircraft and artillery fire, provides the maximum effect on a large target with the minimum expenditure of combat power and the least amount of aircraft exposure. tank troop is the basic fighting element in armored operations. It normally functions as part of a squadron and will be called upon to conduct a variety of tasks. In the offense, as part of a combat team, the troop could be involved in the advance to contact, deliberate attacks, or high-speed exploitation and pursuit operations. In the defense, the troop may act as part of the covering force it may fight from prepared positions near or alongside the infantry, or it may be held for use as part of a blocking or counter-attack force. While holding in a hide, the combat team commander issues a warning order for occupying a defensive position. Charlie, Charlie, three. This is three. A warning order. Situation. Enemy. Platoon dug in at grid. The immediate six, priority six, for the five, squadron seven, before six. moving into a harbor is to rearm and refuel its tanks at a running replenishment site, which is set up by the squadron's A-1 echelon. When it is ready, the squadron sergeant major informs the squadron, and the troops move through one at a time to receive fuel, ammunition, rations, and any other items requested on the previous day's administrative report. After completing its replenishment cycle, each troop drops off a harbor guide with the SSM, who will act as the harbor master. Before arriving at the harbor location, Crew commanders ensure that all radio speakers, lights, and vehicle heaters are turned off. Under direction of the harbor master, the guides meet their arriving troops at the contact point. They direct each tank into position following the track plan. After the tanks are shut down, the sentries take up their posts. Meanwhile, the guides brief their troop leaders on the harbor situation. When the last tank is in position, the troop goes on a two-minute listening silence. Once the area has been reported clear by combat team headquarters, harbor routine begins. The troop leader is responsible for the enforcement of harbor discipline, as 
as well as ensuring the sentries are briefed, that his tanks all have interlocking arcs, and that the adjacent troops' arcs in sentry positions are coordinated with his. He also selects a nearby troop RV in case a crash harbor occurs. The troop warrant officer assists the troop leader in determining what tank repairs and replacements are required and completes the troops' ammunition, casualty, and POL states. Twenty minutes after his last tank has shut down, the troop leader reports to squadron headquarters, passes on his troop state to the battle captain, and receives his harbor orders. The troop leader plans for the next day's operation by making a quick map reconnaissance, looking at where he has to go, the route to be followed, and calculating the time it will take to get there. He then makes his initial time estimate, working backwards from the time at which he must have his position occupied, with the key known timing being that of the combat team commander's orders group. He takes into consideration the time needed for all battle preparations, including his own orders, as well as time for movement to and preparation of his battle position. One, two, three, the troop leader four, then five, writes six. a warning order, which he passes down Lowers to his two IC, who then relays it to the crew commanders and directs the appropriate battle preparations. The troop leader arrives at combat team headquarters 15 minutes prior to the orders group to copy the map trace so that his runner can take it to the troop location along with any new information needed by the troop warrant officer to finalize battle preparations. Depend from 312 or 305. The troop is tasked with occupying part of the combat team battle position, as well as with deploying two tanks forward to snipe at the lead elements of the enemy's advance. Once he has his orders, the troop leader makes a more detailed map appreciation, time estimate, and prepares a recce plan. He will likely make changes to his initial warning order. He then conducts a reconnaissance of his assigned defensive position. At the same time, liaison is effected between himself and the local infantry commander to coordinate the positioning of the tanks and the infantry trenches. With his recce completed, the troop leader finalizes his detailed plan, prepares orders, and then delivers them to his crew commanders. In accordance with his battle procedure, the troop leader moves his troop from the harbor into its proposed battle position. He assigns primary and secondary arcs of fire, designates alternate positions, details the marking of turning and reference points, and supervises preparations for defense. Each crew commander prepares a panoramic sketch of his area of responsibility, showing potential targets arcs, and general terrain features. When preparation of the position is completed, the troop leader inspects turret and hull down positions, camouflage, and arcs of fire. The troop then moves into a hide located a short distance from its battle position. The drill for occupying a hide is exactly the same as that for a harbor. A hide, as the name implies, must have concealment, as well as an easy breakout route to the battle position. It is laid out for all round defense, tanks are well dispersed, and all activity, especially noise, is kept to a minimum. The troop leader conducts a final briefing ensures that all his tanks are ready for battle and that the crews know exactly what they are to do in the coming action. If time allows, the troop is fed and allotted a period of forced rest. 
If circumstances permit, the squadron practices running up and occupying the battle position. These deployment practices are clocked and the combat team commander is informed to ensure that he is aware of the reaction time required. Before first light, sniping tanks move forward to their positions and the squadron goes on five minutes notice to move. Contact grid one one eight five three. First contact is made. Two T-72s in tree line, a one engaged, continuing to engage other, over. And the details of enemy location, strength, and activity are passed to battle group HQ as the sniping tanks return to their troop location. The squadron moves into its battle position, shuts off engines to reduce thermal signature, and awaits the arrival of the main enemy force. When the firefight begins, weapons engage at maximum ranges, as was specified in the combat team commander's orders. The troop leader's responsibility is to maintain fire discipline. In a target-poor environment, the troop leader allocates tanks to engage while others remain turret down. As more and more targets appear, fire is controlled by each crew commander, with the troop leader observing the overall effect. Jockeying between firing positions is vital to the troop's survival. The troop leader coordinates this movement to ensure that at least half of his troop is always fighting. As the battle progresses and ammunition is depleted, its redistribution and replenishment become vital tasks. Battle replenishment activity is conducted at a concealed RV behind the troop. The site is set up by the SSM and A1 Echelon at the location directed by the squadron HQ. The tanks move back on order and are resupplied with ammo and fuel. They then return to their positions and carry on with the fight. The attack has been halted and the troop, as part of the combat team, receives a warning order to advance and engage the enemy before he can resume his offensive. Call sign a 3-2 facing northeast. Call sign a 3 Bravo authorized to check fire. Golf 4-1 acknowledge over. Radio orders for the advance are given and the combat team moves out. When the troop crosses the line of departure, its formation will be determined by the shape and closeness of the ground, the enemy threat, and by whether the troop is being supported by the rest of the squadron or by other arms anti-armor assets. Possible troop formations include box, in which each tank of the troop makes up one corner of the rectangle, echelon left or echelon right, in which the troop is strung out diagonally to the left or right of the lead tank, staggered column, in which the tanks travel on alternate sides of the same route, Line, normally used in the assault, in which the troop travels abreast of the troop leader's tank. And column, normally used only for administrative moves and negotiating defiles, in which tanks travel one behind the other. The troop advances by bounds using the ground, fire and movement and mutual support, both within the troop and throughout the squadron and combat team. Caterpillar movement is used when enemy contact is imminent. It offers maximum protection since both static and moving forces have time to search the ground before moving. Leapfrog movement is both quicker than caterpillar and riskier as the moving elements do not see the ground they are to cross until they are actually crossing it. Snake movement is used when maneuvering through a long defile without infantry or overwatch elements, which requires tanks to provide each other with close support. Contact with the enemy may be made at any time 
and the troops' first priority will be to get their tanks into the nearest positions from where they can bring down effective fire. As soon as he is able, the troop leader makes a call for indirect fire to suppress and blind the enemy. Red 147628, a 2-100 platoon infantry in shell scrapes. Neutralize ASAP, over. When contact is made with anti-tank weapons, they will become a troop target, while any other possible anti-tank weapon positions will be probed with speculative fire. The combat team commander decides to conduct a right flanking with the lead troop acting as fire base. Its task is to provide suppressive and neutralizing fire on the objective while the rest of the combat team moves to its attack position and crosses the line of departure. Normally, the troop leader will order a troop shoot to keep the target constantly engaged while also conserving ammunition. As the assault force closes with the enemy, the fire base shifts fire until the infantry commander orders dismount. Fire is then moved to provide flank and depth protection. On the order to dismount, the assaulting tanks slow down allowing the infantry to close up behind on foot. The troop leader uses his massive weight of fire to shoot his accompanying infantry onto the objective, maintaining the direction of the assault, destroying hard targets, and providing suppressive coaxial machine gun fire. As the infantry begins to consolidate, the troop rolls over to the edge of the objective to form a cordon around the position, protecting the flanks against counterattack while the infantry take the trenches. Other tank troops may be used to exploit this success by pursuing and destroying any withdrawing enemy. While a formidable grouping in itself, the tank troop will never act alone but always as part of a larger grouping or all-arms team. There is, therefore, no such thing as tank troop tactics, only skills and drills. Leading a tank troop, however, demands the sort of initiative, enthusiasm, and discipline under fire that characterize the best of junior officers. Mastery of armor skills and the application of sound leadership will be the troop leader's best guarantee of success on the battlefield.
Offensive air support combines jointly planned and coordinated battlefield air interdiction, tactical air reconnaissance, and close air support missions, which are conducted in direct support of land operations. The Joint Command Operations Center at Allied Tactical Air Force Army Group Level Plans Operations assesses availability and allocates air resources to meet stated needs. The Air Command Operations Center is the air component of the JCOC and exercises operational control of air resources. The Allied Tactical Operations Center converts ACOC's daily operations orders into detailed tactical plans and air task orders. The Air Support Operations Center is an Air Force agency at Corps Headquarters with Land Force representation. The ASOC jointly plans, coordinates, and controls the core allotment of offensive air support sorties. It also monitors activities of the tactical air control parties and any independently operating forward air controllers assigned in support of a division. OAS operations are coordinated on three main land air battle planning lines. The forward line of own troops, which indicates the most forward position of friendly forces at a specific time, and is likely the line of contact with the enemy. The fire support coordination line, which is established by the ground commander to ensure coordination of fire against surface targets, it normally follows a well-defined terrain feature. The reconnaissance interdiction planning line defines the outer limit of battlefield air interdiction operations and is located between the leading enemy army and his second echelon and follow-up forces. The resources available to provide offensive air support include slower moving specialized aircraft such as the A-10, the Harrier, and attack helicopters, which are normally limited to missions from the forward edge of the battle area to the maximum range of their pinpoint ordnance, that is, from 3,500 to 5,000 meters. And high-performance fast movers, such as the F-4, F-16, Tornado, CF-5, and the CF-18, which would be employed against targets that are a safe distance from friendly troops. They normally carry munitions, which cause considerable damage to an area surrounding a planned point of impact. These weapons would only be used close in on the authority of the ground commander. Tactical air reconnaissance is an all-weather activity, employing a variety of resources and a broad spectrum of sensors to acquire intelligence in support of ground forces. Reconnaissance missions provide timely information on the disposition composition, location, activities, and movements of hostile forces, and on enemy installations, lines of communication, and electronic emissions. Mission requests are originated and dealt with in the same way as close air support requirements, except that they are monitored by intelligence staffs at all levels to determine if the needed information already exists. Information is collected through visual sightings and by image and signals intelligence sensors. Visual reconnaissance is simple and efficient. It involves an overflight of a target area or in-flight reports by air crews returning from CAS or BAI missions. Image producing sensors include cameras providing vertical, oblique and panoramic daylight coverage passive infrared sensors capable of penetrating camouflage and thin clouds. Radar sensors normally operating from standoff positions with some systems directly linked to the processing facility. And laser and low light television systems also operating from standoff positions producing real time definitions of the forward area. Passive electronic sensors receive enemy radio and radar signals which are processed to locate and identify each emission. The acquired information is quickly interpreted, evaluated and transmitted to the land commander. 
Battlefield air interdiction involves air action against surface targets likely to directly affect friendly forces. These missions disrupt enemy movement and cause losses throughout the battle area as well as isolating forward enemy organizations from their reinforcements and supplies. BAI targets are mainly the area type and do not require an FAC. They include armored columns, vehicle convoys, railway rolling stock, road junctions, river crossings, choke points, headquarters and signal units, troop concentrations, bridges, fuel and ammunition dumps, weapons positions, and targets of opportunity. These targets require joint planning and coordination and are not normally integrated into the core commander's tactical plan. BAI missions are normally flown on the far side of the FSCL up to the RIPL using high performance aircraft which usually attack straight in at very low level and high speed to achieve surprise and lessen vulnerability. Radar bombing techniques provide night and all weather capability. Close air support provides responsive firepower to destroy or neutralize the most immediately threatening enemy maneuver elements that are very close to friendly land force units. Attacks are carried out at the request of local ground commanders and all are coordinated and integrated with the fire and movement of ground forces. CAS is particularly valuable for engaging armored and soft skin vehicles hardened positions, bridging equipment, weapon sites, and troop concentrations which are close to the flot and inaccessible or invulnerable to ground fire. CAS should only be employed when the division's organic firepower cannot deal with a threat. Missions normally involve the establishment of safe air corridors and a local no-fire area surrounding the target. Nearby air defense elements are placed on weapons tight or weapons hold status during an attack and pilots are instructed on avoiding nearby concentrations of artillery fire. The classic form of CAS missions are those flown in the area of the contact battle where it is difficult to distinguish between friendly and enemy forces and involve direct control by an FAC. CAS aircraft must visually acquire the target to complete the attack. Targets more than a thousand meters away and separated from our forces will likely be controlled on an indirect basis and are not dependent on the FAC for success. Daylight operations are the norm, but some night or poor weather sorties may be undertaken employing flares, infrared devices, or laser guided bombs and missiles. Successful offensive air support missions require the suppression of local enemy air defense systems. The coordination and conduct of SEAD operations for BAI and TAR missions is primarily an Air Force responsibility. The land forces are mainly responsible for CAS missions and aviation operations very near the flot. The amount of offensive air support made available to ground forces will be determined by the size, scope, and concept of various operations, the capabilities of the enemy, and the availability of air assets. Offensive air support missions must be coordinated with other supporting arms operations to best meet the needs of the land force commander.
All pilots operating in the combat zone are subject to the highly sophisticated enemy air defense forces that are deployed to destroy or nullify the effectiveness of our aircraft. The threat includes a likely scenario of communications jamming, acquisition by early warning and tracking radars, and attacks by air defense artillery, missile, and gun systems. Enemy air defense weapons maintain coverage for their associated maneuver force with short-range weapons positioned to maintain point coverage, and longer-range weapons provide a multi-level umbrella over the battlefield. Their long-range radar-directed systems effectively deny medium and high-altitude attacks by our strike aircraft, while their short-range missiles will be employed in combination with guns against aircraft operating near the forward line owned troops. Enemy weapon systems employ radar and optical modes for minimum radiation exposure, plus a variety of missile guidance schemes with a broad spectrum of radar frequencies help counter chaff and jamming. Observers fill any gaps in the electronic surveillance screen. The enemy air defense picture is further reinforced by soldiers who are trained in aircraft recognition and their combat vehicles which incorporate air defense capable systems. Aviation elements cannot expect to survive on the high intensity battlefield if they expose themselves more than momentarily to these weapons. Direct and indirect fire support should be made available to cover strike fighters and aviation formations moving forward over predetermined routes and just prior to their entry into the target or objective area. Additionally, dedicated elements of the attacking force will likely be needed to engage any undetected enemy air defense weapons that open up. It will not be enough to defeat one gun or missile system, obscure optics, or to jam a limited frequency spectrum. A dedicated effort must be made to destroy all enemy air defense elements within a given area as soon as they are detected, or when they are near enough to engage our close air support aircraft. Localized joint suppression of enemy air defenses permits the conduct of close air support and tactical aviation activities by protecting friendly aircraft during an air operation or when transiting the flock. This is accomplished by destroying, neutralizing, or temporarily degrading their effectiveness by physical attack or electronic warfare. Typical CAD targets in the forward area include self-propelled radar-controlled guns deployed just behind leading tanks and APCs, towed short-range guns which cover frontline elements, man portable weapons protecting point targets, short-range missile carriers deployed forward with armored columns and in the rear of the first echelon area, low and medium altitude guns and missiles with the leading divisions providing forward support and protecting critical rear area assets, and acquisition and fire control radars with their associated control and communications centers. These targets are normally suppressed by a combination of means. This involves destructive attacks against enemy equipment and personnel, which render these incapable of continuing an operation, and disruptive attacks, which temporarily degrade, deceive, or neutralize enemy systems by jamming, chaff, flares, deception, and flight evasion tactics. The major problems surrounding localized CAD activities include large numbers of undetectable handheld weapons spread throughout the forward area and concentrated around vital points. The difficulty in acquiring the locations of a large number of camouflaged systems with enough accuracy to permit effective engagement by indirect fire. High consumption rates of artillery ammunition for target neutralization and fire units engaged in suppression shoots will not be available to support other division operations and will likely receive retaliatory fire. Both land and air forces have varying degrees of capability to suppress enemy air defenses. 
This capability is enhanced by joint planning and coordination by various staffs and by conducting operations within defined areas of responsibility. The Land Force's operational responsibility for SEAD activities lies primarily in the area of the flot against those threats which can be engaged by observed fire and ground-based jammers. Ground formations integrate a SEAD effort into each close air support and tactical aviation operation and disseminate any acquired intelligence on enemy air defense systems to the appropriate aviation and air force agencies. The SEAD effort includes joint planning to help identify those elements of the enemy's air defenses that will be attacked and in what priority, allocation of land-based resources in support of SEAD activities, and joint conduct of both in-depth activities against enemy standoff systems and localized activities against close-in systems. The division commander is responsible for the conduct of SEAD operations within his area of influence. These are affected by the Fire Support Coordination Center. The FSCC resolves airspace conflicts, maintains a priority SEAD list, and ensures airspace users coordinate their activities with those responsible for active suppression. In addition, it plans an effective response to SEAD requests, advises on the level of support available, and jointly makes decisions on whether to proceed or cancel a requested SEAD activity. Interested persons in the FSCC include artillery personnel for the planning of general fire tasks, the artillery intelligence officer for the application of counter-bombardment tasks against enemy air defense targets, the aviation representative who plans and controls division-assigned aviation resources, the tactical air liaison representative who plans and controls allocated close air support sorties, and the electronic warfare representative who directs the ECM method. The task is assisted by the G2 staff who provide intelligence relating to the location of active enemy air defense elements, the current enemy ground or air threat, an assessment of target engagement priorities, and recommendations for drone and remotely piloted vehicle missions. The air liaison officer also assists by alerting the FSCC on air assets that will be arriving over the division's operational area and ensuring that the planned application of SEAD resources will at least meet the designated mission risk criteria. The Air Force retains overall responsibility for planning the joint SEAD effort integral to the structure of each air mission, the determination of the local threat priorities, and the collection and dissemination of intelligence on enemy air defenses. These functions are handled by the Core Air Support Operations Center and by tactical air control parties assigned to divisions and brigades, which also nominate targets, advise on weapons or ordnance, initiate target requests, keep order of battle data, oversee mission results, and coordinate the air input to SEAD activities. The Air Force's execution responsibility begins at the forward limit of observed fire and extends to the unobserved limits of the support which may be provided by land force indirect fire weapons and continues in depth to the range of its tactical aircraft. It is achieved by visual sensor target indication from aircraft, by attack fighter, and helicopter weapons platforms employing a variety of ordnance and with specialized ECM aircraft. Air Force directed attacks are best conducted by specialist aircraft whose crews are trained to locate, attack, and neutralize enemy ground-based radar-directed systems, including command, control, and communications assets. These attacks involve jamming radar frequencies, dropping chaff to mask radar returns, launching anti-radiation missiles, and directing airstrikes against known AD elements. Enemy air defense weapons and their associated equipment and facilities are handled as another target on the battlefield. Their neutralization is a form of counter-bombardment 
that will likely be required in support of our own airstrikes, air mobile, or air assault operations. The methods of planning for and executing CAD requirements are no different than those used to suppress hostile artillery fire with targets being engaged in accordance with priorities established by the operational commanders. Commander integrates the firepower of all direct and indirect fire weapons and maneuver forces to maximize his combat power. As he develops his plan for the employment of his force, he envisages how his fire support resources will be used, what targets to attack with what means, and the priorities for engagement. Fire support encompasses command and control, coordination, target acquisition, weapons, and ammunition. The command, control, and coordination involve those organizations and functions which help provide fire support, including those tactical and technical actions needed to attack targets quickly and effectively. Target acquisition includes a number of battlefield resources, used for the timely detection, identification, and location of ground targets in sufficient detail to permit effective attack by supporting weapons. Weapons and ammunition involve all indirect fire weapons, mainly gun and rocket artillery, mortars, close support aircraft, attack helicopters with their variety of munitions, along with active electronic warfare assets that are available to the commander. Each component functions in concert with the others, with fire support being planned downwards and coordinated upwards. Artillery advisors, air liaison, and EW personnel are located at all formation command posts, where they are in continuous personal contact with the operation staff. They actively inject fire support into the planning and execution of the operation, anticipating changes and advising on how it can best influence the battle on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Fire support normally results from a commander allocating resources in a written operations order to formations and to division troops. The division operations order specifies the artillery, air, aviation, and electronic warfare support that is available, any imposed limitations, how it is allocated, and any special instructions on how maneuver and fire support are to be integrated and coordinated. It establishes the direction of target acquisition, 
and intelligence efforts and the desired target effects guidelines. It may also include a list of target priorities that the commander decides are crucial to success. Fire planning integrates fire support with maneuver. The planning process anticipates requirements and ensures adequate fire support is integrated into the battle plan. Recommends the most effective means of attacking a target using minimum appropriate resources. Uses all available target information. Remains flexible to provide for changing needs plans fire to protect troops and minimize the exposure of fire units and develops an efficient and fully integrated fire plan. The planning process mainly involves artillery, air and operations staff at formation and unit headquarters. The artillery fire plan flows from the direction given in the division operations order. It is prepared by Fire Support Coordination Center artillery staff, with target requirements being provided by maneuver commanders. Fire plans integrating air and attack helicopters with direct fire elements are also coordinated by the artillery staff, who are assisted by liaison personnel from the involved units. Their complexity and depth depends on how much time is available and the level at which the planning occurs. The close air support plan is prepared by the division air liaison officer in conjunction with the core air allotment, requests from the formations and division troops, and the requirements of the division operations order. All missions are coordinated within the division FSCC prior to being passed on for approval. Fire support coordination welds together the fire plan and the maneuver plan. It includes the coordination of all forms of indirect fire and on occasion certain forms of direct fire. The coordination process anticipates changes and recommends revisions to the fire plan, directs the attack of targets according to the priority established by the commander, tasks the most effective fire support means to engage targets coordinates all fire within assigned boundaries, ensures the safeguarding of friendly elements, and maintains the continuing flow of tactical targeting information. Coordination involves the artillery commander, FSCC staffs, and the tactical air control parties at unit and formation headquarters. Dedicated communications for fire planning, and the execution of fire missions and certain rules and guidelines for selected areas of the battlefield for given time periods. The artillery commander at all levels is the fire support coordinator and normally functions from the FSCC. He develops a cohesive fire support coordination team, provides advice to the commander on the capabilities and use of all fire support measures coordinates all available means to ensure targets are adequately covered, prevents duplication, ensures safety, and allocates the right weapon to each target. Should naval, air, or aviation representatives not be available, their functions will be carried out by the artillery. Fire support coordination measures are undertaken at all levels to ensure that fire will not jeopardize the safety of our own troops or aircraft interfere with other fire support means or disrupt adjacent unit operations. These measures include boundaries, no fire lines, fire support coordination lines, and restricted fire lines. 
Boundaries are established to define an operational area in which the commander fires and maneuvers. They prohibit others from firing into that area unless they conduct cross-boundary coordination. A no-fire line defines the area short of which artillery does not fire without coordination. These lines are mainly established by brigade commanders and are employed to protect forward elements. The fire support coordination line permits the engagement of all targets beyond it by air and naval forces with a minimum of coordination. It is established by the Corps commander and is based on readily identifiable ground features. A restricted fire line prohibits fire across a line established between converging forces, typically involving airborne, heliborne, or seaborne operations. The Division FSCC operates under the artillery commander with personnel and equipment provided by Division Artillery Headquarters. At Brigade Headquarters, resources come from the assigned close support medium regiment. These may be augmented by specialist air, electronic warfare, and air defense liaison officers, and on occasion might include LOs from the attack squadron or other fire support agencies. The battle group FSCC is normally based on the personnel and equipment of the assigned direct support battery commander, augmented by resources from the mortar platoon. The battery commander operates the FSCC and is responsible for the coordination of all indirect fire support available to the battle group. Specifically, the FSCC provides advice to the supported commander on the capabilities and use of all fire support resources plans and coordinates all fire support available to the unit of formation, coordinates air defense activities, and orders weapon states, and allots fire support resources to meet each specific request, including weapon selection and processing requests which cannot be met from its own resources. Fire plans are received by the FSCC, coordinated and passed on to the appropriate fire unit for action. When a request cannot be met, available alternatives may be suggested, or the request can be passed on to the next higher headquarters. Communications interlinking the FSCC include the battle group or formation command net, the artillery command nets, the air request and tactical air direction nets, and other nets involving agencies providing fire support to the force. The FSCC communications are maintained during the move by using the formation's alternate headquarters FSCC or through a step-up element until communications and control are re-established. During an operation, the FSCC monitors the implementation of any timed fire plan, keeps an up-to-date situation map, showing unit boundaries, other limiting measures, and troop locations as they change. Coordinates for on-call fire missions, which are plotted and visually inspected relative to limiting measures and troop locations. Silence is the consent for the request, and interruptions are only made if danger exists for a friendly unit. Questionable targets that plot close to adjacent boundaries or near troop positions are coordinated with the appropriate FSCC. Missions outside a unit's boundaries are coordinated with the affected unit. Ongoing airstrikes and other fire support activities are also monitored. Those that fall short of the FSCL must be under the positive control of a forward air controller, forward observation officer or other fire controller. Information on fire missions beyond the no-fire line and short of the FSCL is passed on to the appropriate air agency. In addition, the FSCC is kept posted on and assists with air attack missions 
directed at suppression of enemy air defense weapon systems. Target analysis is an aid to the fire planning and coordination process. It is mainly carried out against depth targets by artillery and air liaison officers operating from the formation FSCC. It involves locating the target and determining its nature quickly, selecting the munition and delivery system, and passing orders to attack it with sufficient accuracy to achieve surprise thus catching the enemy before he can take cover or disperse. Lengthy adjustment, increased communications, and locating activity will give forewarning and may endanger our positions and fire units. A potential target is examined to provide proper target selection advice to the maneuver commander, to attack targets in the proper precedence and to designate the best means of attack to achieve the desired target effect considering target location accuracy, target type, resources available, and safety of our troops. The best mix of resources is selected by the artillery, air, or aviation advisor in consultation with the maneuver commander. Advice to the commander generally involves recommendations on the feasibility of neutralizing or destroying a target. Neutralization of a target temporarily knocks it out of battle, causing casualties and serious battle damage to at least 10% of the enemy force. Fire can be delivered by any available means, and the resources required for neutralization vary according to the type and size of the target and the weapon ammunition combination used. Destruction puts the target permanently out of action and is aimed at inflicting 30% or more casualties or material damage in a short time period. Direct hits are required to destroy hard targets, generally requiring use of precision guided or sensing projectiles. These missions usually require a very large expenditure of ammunition. In determining the precedence of the attack, the primary consideration is the target priorities which have been determined by the maneuver commander. Targets are also considered in respect to their potential danger and may be generally categorized into those which will prevent the execution of the plan, those which can cause serious interference, and those which may cause limited disruption of the operation. Other specific considerations involve characteristics of the target, which may vary considerably in composition, protection, size, shape, mobility, and recuperative ability, proximity of the target to friendly troops, and accuracy of the target locations, and weather, which may greatly affect some types of munitions. The analysis process also considers the characteristics of available fire support to determine which is most capable of producing the desired effects on the target. This includes the availability of various weapon systems, their vulnerability to enemy counterfire, their accuracy and response time. It will normally recommend a method of attack which details the number of units required to ensure adequate concentration and the duration of the fire. The completed analysis forms the basis in deciding to immediately attack a target, defer the attack, placing it on call, to disregard the target, or to pass it back to a higher formation. The fire support subsystem of the automated combat information system is used by staffs to assist with detailed fire planning activities, the coordination of fire support, the development of target intelligence, target analysis, and to optimize the use of fire support resources. It integrates the wide range of direct, indirect, 
air, and aviation elements into a single working entity, allowing for the best use of each asset. Fire support involves planning and coordination functions which occur simultaneously at all levels of command from the combat team to the Corps. These functions drive the fire support plan to respond to the commander's requirements and to integrate fire support with maneuver. They optimize the combat power of the division and achieve maximum effectiveness from every mission fired or sortie flown. Throughout any operation, the coordination of artillery and other resources is the gunner's task. The fire plan remains the responsibility of the operational commander and may involve not only artillery, but also weapons of other arms, as well as aircraft and ships. This division between coordination and planning requires a close interrelationship between the commander and his gunner, who work together from the outset. The Brigade Group Service Battalion has been tasked to move a load of combat supplies by helicopter to a combat team operating at a distant location. The duty officer completes a staff check to ensure all the required resources are on hand, that the mission coordinates are correct, and passes the requirement to the transport company command post. The transport company duty officer logs the mission and then passes on the details of the task to the tactical air movement section and the combat supplies platoon. The TAMS representatives consult their technical data for the type of helicopter and slung loads to be employed and prepares a load table for the upcoming mission. At the same time, the combat supplies platoon gathers the required commodities and groups them into loads as directed by the TAMS planner. Basic load criteria includes not mixing ammunition with other commodities and segregating fuel from rations to avoid contamination. Simultaneously, other TAMS members draw and check out their equipment, which includes cargo slings, nets, straps, reach pendants, CCC-1 containers, connector hardware, lights, safety equipment and a radio. The TAMS representative contacts the receiving unit to confirm the grid, the markings of the destination landing zone, and to arrange for marshalling assistance. They also sort out the details for equipment recuperation once the task is completed. Previously, the service battalion LZ has been recce'd and prepared for operation. The recce has ensured that the landing zone provides a safety perimeter of 35 meters for the UTTH and 100 meters for MTH. Hard standings with the slope of the LZ not exceeding 15%. Easy access for vehicles and a parking area. Good approach and departure paths in relation to the type of helicopters and loads to be carried. Tree clearance for the approach and departure paths can be calculated by placing a man or object of six feet at 50 paces from the center of the landing zone 
An observer's eye at the ground level then looks above the man or object. If the tree line can be seen, the path is not suitable. The process must be repeated for the slung load touchdown point. Site preparations include clearing trees and stumps in the immediate vicinity of the landing zone, removing rocks, logs, and loose debris, and ensuring the landing zone is free as possible from snow or dust. The LZ recce and subsequent site preparations are normally completed by a tasked organization and are not a TAM's responsibility. On arrival at the site, the Thames proceeds to set up the landing zone. This includes control, layout, and access to the LZ area. Setting up the LZ communications and marking the landing zone. Location of the LZ is normally referenced in conjunction with a prominent ground feature and is identified by displaying a prearranged colored smoke or light signal. The helicopter touchdown point is marked by lights in the form of a T or an inverted Y. Loads are brought forward and stacked at the load pickup point in accordance with the mission timings and the loading plan. At night, loads are marked with beanbag lights or by ground guides with flashlight wands. A red light indicates the next load to be picked up. Prior to the arrival of the helicopters, the TAMS representative confirms that the loads on the ground meet mission requirement and that the individual load priorities have been properly established. Once the loads are staked, each is inspected to ensure that it is stable and properly built up. It is the personal responsibility of the TAMS OIC to ensure that all load criteria are met. The correct marshalling signals are of vital importance to the efficient and safe operation of any LZ. These include move ahead, move back, move right, move left, move down, move up, landing direction, take off, land, and hover. The marshaller concludes each signal in the hover position. The basic ground team includes the LZ controller, a ground marshaller, a hook man, and a safety man. The LZ controller has the overall responsibility for the operation of the LZ, including all the involved safety and load parameters. The ground marshaller provides all marshaling directions to the helicopter. The hook man is responsible for hookup activity and the safety man watches out for and assists the hook man as required. Personnel operating under or near hovering helicopters will wear helmet and eye protectors at all times. At an appropriate time, the LZ controller establishes communication with the helicopter to confirm details of the mission, the loads to be lifted, and the weight of loads. Hotel Niner, this is one Any unusual one information on the destination landing zone is relayed. A radio homing signal may also be required to assist the helicopter in locating the LZ. In a tactical situation, the LZ identification signal, along with the approach lights, would only be displayed just before the arrival of the helicopter. A complicated lift may require the helicopter to land so that the TAMS representative and the helicopter loadmaster can conclude the necessary liaison prior to starting the movement operation. After arrival, the helicopter is directed to the desired load. The ground marshaller 
signals instructions to the flight engineer who uses the aircraft intercom to direct the pilot. The hook man stands on the right of the load, holding the ring of the reach pendant at an appropriate height. When the jaw of the cargo suspension hook is at the right point, he slams the ring into the hook. He then checks for positive closure, confirms closure to the flight engineer, and then exits to the right, confirming his departure to the pilot. The marshaller signals for takeoff, and the helicopter picks up the load and leaves for the distant LZ. Safe practices are an important part of any operation. Ground personnel must exercise caution during the hookup operation to prevent them from being trapped between helicopter skid and the load, from being thrown off balance by reaching for the hook, or from being shocked by a charge of static electricity. Spoilers or drags may have to be added to prevent the load from flying up and damaging the helicopter, or making wide oscillations during forward flight. A swivel may be required in the hookup strap to prevent it from breaking should the load spin. And the hookup strap should be kept short so as to prevent whiplash damage to the helicopter's radar dome should the strap break. This production shows the basics of the TAMS ground activity in conjunction with an aerial resupply mission. This production should be viewed in conjunction with the DND production on helicopter resupply operations, part one. Tactical airlift provides for the immediate and responsive air movement and delivery of personnel, supplies, and equipment to objective areas within the theater of operations. It implies operations from austere airfields in a potentially hostile environment, the flexibility to respond to varying mission requirements, and the ability to operate without complex ground support. Implicit in the tactical air movement of joint forces are planning staffs which decide priorities, allocate resources, and prepare movement programs within the overall priorities decided by the force commander. Base airfields, along with forward airheads, airstrips, landing, drop and extraction zones, and facilities at each location to determine and configure aircraft loads, call them forward, and secure them for delivery as well as necessary support personnel to arrange load delivery to the airfield, supervise loading, and prepare documentation. Tactical airlift missions basically involve para-assault by airborne forces and their accompanying pathfinders, air-landed assaults by ground forces, resupply by paradrop and low altitude parachute extraction system, air landed resupply, aeromedical evacuation, special airlift missions, and tactical air to air refueling. Parachute and air landed assaults are joint airborne operations involving the movement of combat forces into an objective area and may involve different types of units and aircraft. It includes the subsequent logistic support of these forces until link-up or extraction. Logistical airlift is provided to meet specific needs of in-theater forces, especially those engaged in combat operations. 
It may also involve routine flights over established routes between airfields in the rear of the combat zone. Tactical aeromedical evacuation involves the air movement of casualties to or between medical facilities. These flights can be undertaken on short notice from any airfield, including those used to resupply combat ground forces. An aeromedical team of nurses and two medical assistants provides patients with in-flight care. These flights normally operate from the combat zone rearward to the communication zone. Tactical aeromedical staging facilities may be established to complete the chain of evacuation. They receive patients, sustain life, continue treatment, and process patients for onward evacuation within a six-hour time frame. An aeromedical evacuation and control center directs and monitors patient evacuation, coordinates aircraft selection, issues orders for flights, and provides patient status information. Liaison teams may be positioned at any level to provide coordination between the user and the evacuation system. Special missions include those that would generally only involve one aircraft on a specific task, such as high altitude insertion of a deep penetration group, propaganda missions, command and control airlift, aerial resupply or search and rescue in a hostile environment. Air-to-air -air refueling is employed to support in-theater tactical operations that cannot otherwise be accomplished with relatively short-range fighter and close air support aircraft. Those aspects of airborne operations and tactical air transport routinely carried out by helicopters, organic to land force formations, will not be dealt with in this production, as they have been separately covered in other land forces videos. These include Airborne Operations Parts 1 and 2, Air Mobile Operations, The Core Medium Transport Squadron, Helicopter Resupply Operations, the Tactical Aviation Utility Squadron, the Division Tactical Aviation Wing, and medical support in the division. Like, like here for him, the 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 yeah, that, that's why. So Command of the Tactical Air Force within the theater is exercised by the Air Commander through his Air Command Operations Center. The ACOC staff plan, control, and coordinate the employment of tactical airlift and other air forces within the assigned area of operations. Other joint staffs involved in tactical airlift activities include the Air Transport Movement Control Center, which coordinates and allots priorities for air transport support within the theater and coordinates the movement of externally controlled air transport into and out of theater. And the Airlift Control Center, which carries out detailed planning, coordination, and tasking for specific airlift operations. It also provides a focal point for communications, control, and direction of ongoing airlift operations. Requests for tactical airlift may be originated at any level of command within any component of a joint force. Missions are normally pre-planned and require detailed staff coordination to ensure they blend with the operations of other land and air force agencies. The system is, however, capable of reacting to specific immediate requests. Tactical transport aircraft are characterized by the ability to quickly reconfigure from one task to another. Large rear loading doors and integral ramps to facilitate rapid loading and unloading. A cargo compartment capable of carrying air portable equipment required in the operational area. Rugged construction and capable of short takeoff and landing operations. All weather capability with inter-theater range and good cruising speed and the ability to carry out airdrop missions.
Transport aircraft are loaded in accordance with the commander's operational criteria. Combat loading enables troops with their equipment and supplies to immediately disembark, fully prepared for combat. Tactical loading places combat units with their equipment and supplies at the destination airfield in a specified sequence to meet operational requirements. Administrative loading ensures the optimum use of each aircraft's carrying capacity. Airlift missions require joint planning and coordination, but development of the tactical delivery plan rests with air transport staff. Considerations involved in planning include departure airfields must be capable of expeditiously handling the force requirement. Existing air corridors may be utilized to facilitate aircraft flow. Air routes and flight altitudes are planned to avoid enemy ground fire, radar detection, and visual observation by using terrain and contour flight. Physical parameters of the objective area may dictate some variations of the ingress track and traffic patterns. Destination airfields and drop zones must be as secure as possible from ground and air attack and where possible be capable of handling the required complex of approach and runway aids as well as maintenance and material handling equipment. Operations into semi-prepared or austere airstrips will normally be preceded by ground reconnaissance to determine suitability of the landing surface based on aircraft types to be employed, the expected number of landings and takeoffs, and if operations under instrument conditions are necessary. The provision of pathfinder teams or other land force elements to prepare and mark landing or drop zones and provide local weather information. The possible requirement for a tactical air control party to provide air traffic advisory assistance. The deployment of an air transportable communications and control team when sustained landings are envisaged or an instrument flight capability is required. The gathering of all available information to assist the staff function and downward distribution of suitable intelligence to assist flight briefings at all levels and the need for post-flight debriefings and air crew interrogations when aircraft return to further develop the information parameters. The mission flown in a low threat scenario could have individual aircraft following random routings to arrive at a rendezvous point at a predetermined time. There, they would concentrate into a three-ship formation for their run over the drop zone. On leaving the DZ, a fluid trail formation would be adopted and the aircraft would proceed until clear of any threat. In a medium threat environment, the emphasis would be on fighter escorted single ship missions using terrain masking, random routings and very low level flight to a close in initial point. The run over the DZ would include a modified slowdown tactic and a program of suppressive fire to minimize enemy air defense threats near the objective area. Aircraft would be phased over the DZ at one to two minute intervals and once clear they would work their way home. Radar and missile approach warning systems coupled with chaff, flares and radar jamming equipment while using defense maneuvering tactics help reduce the aircraft's en route vulnerability to enemy fighters and other air defense threats. Operations must be jointly planned and coordinated from the outset, with sufficient resources being made available for the duration. It must be remembered that it is especially susceptible to changing weather and the telling effects of enemy action. Tactical airlift can be a valuable tool to assist the ground commander accomplish his aim, and it complements his maneuver by providing a versatile means of inserting troops and equipment into designated areas.